All right, everybody. Welcome to uh, Viz Astro 2020, Visualization in Astrophysics, Developing New Methods, Discovering Our Universe, and Educating the Earth. Um, joined here with our wonderful speakers for today, as well as my co-chairs, Bei Wang from Ski Utah and Lauren Anderson from the Carnegie Institution for Science. I'm Juno Kohlmeyer from the Carnegie Institution for Science. Uh, so I wanted to give an overview of the meeting today. So presenters will be on Zoom. Uh, for presenters, please turn on your Zoom video throughout if your bandwidth and circumstances allow. And we know many people are home uh, owing to the pandemic. And of course we had all planned to be in Salt Lake City together, uh, but it's wonderful to be able to see you guys virtually. Uh, but we understand that there may be uh, different things happening in the background. So if you can't turn your video on, that's okay, we understand. And for attendees, please do put your questions in the Discord channel. We are monitoring that uh, channel and we'll be able to pass along your, uh, your questions to the speakers. This is just an overview of the amazing roster of people that we've gotten together here uh, today. Uh, so I'm gonna try to take as little bit of the time as possible. Um, then we're gonna have some, some talks by Alyssa Goodman, uh, Alex Bach, Jackie Faherty, all talking about different aspects of visualization in, uh, in astrophysics, uh, past, present, and future. Uh, then we'll take a break and hear from Matt Turk, Michelle Borkin, uh, and Angus Forbes, and uh, Joe Burchett. And we're really looking forward to all of those talks. And then finally, we'll close off with uh, our data challenge and the response to that data challenge, as well as some discussions and kind of uh, thinking about the future. And all of these times are in a mountain time. So what are the goals and scopes of the meeting uh, today? Really, the main thing we wanna do is bring together members of the astronomical community and the visualization community with the goals of discussing data sets in astronomy that need sort of new approaches and methodologies. It's a real opportunity for those of you who are vis experts to uh, apply your amazing skills to uh, these data sets. One of the advantages of data uh, uh, in astronomy is that it is not monetized, so we can make our data publicly available, and <laughs> and that is a good basis for um, uh, for uh, for uh, allowing allowing different uh, innovative techniques to to access it. Um, there have been visual, visualization techniques that haven't yet uh, been applied to astronomical data sets, and we see this as an opportunity. Uh, for astronomers uh, to revolutionize their scientific workflow. Um, and finally, uh, visualization techniques really enhance the value of uh, educating people about what we do, making uh, not just astronomical research, but, uh, but research generally readily trans transferable to lay and public audiences. I like to say that astronomy is a gateway science, uh, like a gateway drug. And the better that we can convey uh, the, both the mysteries of the universe as well as our understanding and knowledge of the universe as it stands at present, uh, the better, better we can communicate that to, to all audiences, um, the better we are as a species. Um, we really would love to build bridges. So even though we have a short workshop, relatively short half day workshop today, um, there are certain major stumbling blocks in our understanding of different astrophysical uh, and cosmological models. And we're really hoping that with a sincere partnership with Viz experts who are able to extract signal from um, where there appears to be none, um, that we can, we can sort of break some of those, uh, uh, you know, crack open some of those blocks. And in, in astronomy and cosmology, data has always paved the way for new discoveries, uh, you know, and that includes everything uh, from, uh, you know, general relativity to, to, to supernovae and dark energy. Um, our models and our data have reached a level of complexity that would clearly benefit from new methods. And so we really wanna build bridges between these communities and we'd love to you know, help in building a community of experts that have a common lexicon uh, that bring together our two uh, very different domains. And so that is the spirit in which we are all here. Um, and so, want to just thank uh, our supporters. Uh, we are, uh, the organizers are supported by uh, Ski Utah and we would have been uh, partying in ski had we uh, been there in Salt Lake City um, 
uh, in person and also the Carnegie Institution for Science. So, uh, and, and with that, I will, uh, I will stop and um, let's get the show on the road. And so we will kick off our uh, meeting with Alyssa Goodman. And it's such a pleasure to welcome Alyssa Goodman uh, to our roster here. Alyssa is a world-renowned expert, not just in astrophysics, but also she's been a pioneer in bringing visualization techniques, not just to astronomy, but to other areas of science. And so today she uh, will be giving us uh, an overview of the past, present, and future. And we're just delighted to, to, uh, to have Alyssa Goodman kick off our workshop. So Alyssa, please take it away. Thank you. I'm absolutely delighted to be here. Um, actually, well, I'm not. I mean, I'd much rather be in Utah. I'm, I'm much. I'm very delighted to be with you, <laughs> you all, whoever whoever you are out there. Um, so some of you may recognize this picture uh, because it was uh, everywhere online yesterday. Uh, it was actually it's actually kind of an old picture. Uh, those of you at the Museum of Natural History know that, but we'll just leave you in suspense as to what this picture is in the background for a little while. Okay, so, so I'm tasked with, with, with introducing this session and giving some context to what we're going to be talking about. And given the, the slew of logos at the bottom of the screen, you could get some idea that there's a lot of diversity of interest um, in, in visualization these days. And I chose to focus on kind of the historical context and one single point about astronomy being a, a challenge of going from two dimensions to three dimensions and back. Um, but there's much more I could say about uh, large data sets and things like that. So please do uh, ask in the questions and uh, hopefully we can talk about that in the discussion. But for now, I'm going to try to ask this one question. Okay, so why have astronomers been obsessed with visualization forever? I'll let you think about your answer for just a second. By the way, my cat has decided to come out of his hiding place and we may get Zoom bombed for a little distraction. Um, so why, right? Look at this image and think about why. I'll also start my timer here. Okay, this is my answer. Because the actual universe is very not two-dimensional, okay? But the sky, the sky that we see is two-dimensional. So astronomy, more than any other science, because we can't go where we want to go to look at these things, we have to just take this projected view and try to see what it is that's going on. And this picture will come back to us, the one in the background there for a minute, but I promised some history. So here's a tiny bit of history with some very beautiful images and also kind of the overview of the entire talk that I wanna give. So I'm gonna start here with Ptolemy in 100 AD. We'll zoom to Galileo in just a minute. We'll spend most of our time in the 21st century, but I'm gonna tell you a little bit about this path to Newton here that kind of connects all of history. And then I'm going to spend my time uh, talking about my favorite Greek hero slash constellation, uh, Perseus. And at the end, if we have time, I'm going to talk about what I think are challenges uh, where we could really use more partnership with the Viz community. So I just love this image. It's an image of the Ptolemaic system. It's actually from the 17th uh, century or 16th century. And just in case you don't know what the Ptolemaic system is, here's a terrible illustration of it, but it's basically where the earth is in the center and then Ptolemy invents all these crazy epicycles and equants and all kinds of things to make the earth the center. And you notice the sun there going around the earth. Okay, so the order of the planets in that system was moon, the moon was the first planet, <clears throat> and then the normal order, Mercury, Venus, oh, sun, that's because we switched the earth and the sun, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, and then the firmament, everything else, okay? So this is what the two-dimensional view of the sky led people to conclude was going on in terms of the solar system, which basically was the known universe, you know, in 2,000 years ago and more. Mm. And... Um, <clears throat> that view persisted really until at least the 16th century. Um, there was a lot of questioning of it, which I'll uh, talk about in a second when I show you this path to Newton. But for the visualization people, I just wanted to show you how gorgeous the kind of illustration that was done such a long time ago was. And if you look at the annotation of this thing, I'll translate it for you. It's telling you, you know, what they thought the orbits of various planets were. And of course, the orbit of the sun, nay, Earth, was 365 days. So I, I wish, by the way, that we could get to a level where our, um, uh, whatchamacallit, uh, annotation was this gorgeous. I don't know why technician person, but the floating meeting controls are spontaneously showing up on my screen. And 
messing up some of the animation. So if that could not happen again, that would be excellent. Okay, so there's Ptolemy. So Ptolemy lived at 100 AD. And uh, <clears throat> you notice that he's got this little zoom in here under his, under his picture uh, and a little circle. It says epicycles, equins, eccentrics. These are all the crazy things he proposed. And you see some arrows going in there. And like, what is that all about? Please stop putting this back on my screen if you can stop. <laughs> I don't know how to stop it, but we'll just try. Okay, so anyway, Ptolemy uh, fits in here in this big long story of what I call the path to Newton. So I don't usually do infographics, this isn't usually my thing, um, but I partnered with some other people to try to explain how you get to a predictive theory in astronomy, the, 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 the theory of gravity, that basically no other science has such a predictive theory. And I say this with only a small amount of authority given to me by the fact that I teach a giant course on prediction with 30 other faculty at Harvard, but that still does not make me an expert. But I will tell you that uh, Newton's theory of gravity is pretty much the most predictive thing we have in science. So I'll just leave it at that. And I'll show you just for fun, this lovely infographic and all the stuff that's yellow is wrong and all the stuff that's green or teal is right. And this actually isn't just a, uh, a big beautiful poster you can print on your wall, put up on your wall. It's actually uh, an interactive website. And so I thought I would just give you some sense of, of how I like to use interactivity in education uh, in, in apps that don't look at the sky. Okay, so there's Ptolemy and we can mess around and read about Ptolemy and uh, you know, we can keep reading and we can read about some Indian mathematicians and then you know what, I really wanna scroll down to the Renaissance and oh yeah, Kepler, I remember him. Oh, I'm gonna click on Kepler and see where he is in the chart. And oh yeah, yeah, wait, there's this Galileo guy. He's like really, really important. He said something about Jupiter and the moons and has something to do with our understanding of the solar system. So there you go, I just skipped like 1600 years for you because I wanna talk about people who really took this two dimensional sky and tried to make sense of it in three dimensions. So Galileo cheated, Galileo used the telescope um, and that changed a lot. So Galileo could suddenly see a model of what our solar system with just for the non-astronomers, the sun is in the middle and the other planets go around it. Okay, just, just in case you didn't know that for sure. Okay, so he saw another system with a big thing in the middle and figured out that other little things go around it and that system was Jupiter and its moons. And so he drew these very famous diagrams. Um, and so this is from one of the most famous books in all of physics is called Sidereus Nuncius, the starry messenger. And so Galileo, uh, on the left there, you see his handwritten notes, although even they have been cleaned up some, but this is his notebook from observing out in January of 1610. And he's saying, oh, there's this big thing in the middle and there are these little things and they seem to be moving. And so these are two dimensional projections of what it looks like when there's a big object with little objects orbiting it. And by the way, eventually he published it in a, in a printed manuscript. And just for fun, my, my colleague and friend Edward Tufte likes to point out that if you try to recreate Jupiter's orbits from where these typeset asterisks are, you get it wrong because the technology of visualization at the day actually limited the accuracy of the reproduction. But just for fun, I'm going to show this slightly old uh, Worldwide Telescope interactive, and I'm just making sure that the sound is on well enough for you. Hopefully the technician can adjust it if it doesn't work. I'm going to show you like 20 seconds of a six minute so-called worldwide telescope tour that just shows you what you can do when you overlay the two dimensional information to try to let the three dimensional ideas come through. So, Galileo understood that if he could have observed Jupiter without interruption by daylight or poor weather, he would have seen this. Can someone nod if you can hear Today okay? we can see Galileo's correct picture from many perspectives, including a calculated view of Jupiter and its moons as seen from above. These modern images are taken from space. Right, so poor Galileo has to rotate this in his head and we can just go to Worldwide Telescope and recreate Jupiter and its moons with great accuracy however we want. And better than that, we can also use tools like Worldwide Telescope, importantly, or Aladdin or ESA Sky, um, basically tools that can access a lot of uh, databases that show you the sky in its natural context, you know, images of the sky to add additional information. And I just want to tell you that I, I mentioned I was going to talk about Perseus a bunch in this talk later, and that's a big region of the sky. And just for fun, I thought I would show you this little diversion of what happens when you want to actually research Perseus uh, using some of the tools that I'll only talk about very quickly. So this is this website we made quite a while ago now, 
was called the ADS All Sky Survey. And if I if I look here, this is kind of a really weird view of the sky. If I much if I push this slider this way, this is an image in the infrared of the sky. And if I go this way, this is a map of the density of articles on the sky. Okay. And so if I wanted, you know, to go to Perseus, I could type my personal favorite region in Perseus. So it was taller. Okay, and so here we are. And if I go back to the image, I can say, oh yeah, I don't think I recognize it at that wavelength. I could choose to a different wavelength. And you know, if, oh, I want to see all these sources, and you know, it's this region I'm interested in. And then I can get all of these articles, or I can just go open the papers themselves um, in in ADS. You know, or I could see the data. Okay, I'm not going to give it permission to do everything. You believe me? Okay. So anyway. Worldwide Telescope is one of these tools that I do not have time to demonstrate. I hope somebody else will mention it, but it can do, it's like a Swiss army knife, okay? So you can visualize uh, Galileo's uh, observations, or you can see all the papers that you ever wanted to see about Perseus. And it itself is now part of many other of these tools. And a lot of these tools like East of Sky, for example, you can click, see the same view in Worldwide Telescope. In a Worldwide Telescope, you can click, see the same view in East of Sky. And they're not exactly the same. They show you different parts of the sky. I mean, different, the same part of the sky, but different attached tools. And I like to think of the way that we're moving to this open source modular architecture as the snap circuits kit in that little illustration there. I don't know how many of you have ever had that. <clears throat> but instead of having to solder things, you just snap parts in and out to make whatever you want, you know, a radio or a doorbell or anything. Um, and so it's not quite like that with the software uh, that I'm talking about now, but it's almost like that. And that's why for those of you who have never seen this before, you might find it a little confusing. Like how many different things is she talking about at the same time? I'm really talking about like a system of systems that can kind of plug into each other. But let me go back to my central point. All right which is that our universe is not two dimensional, um, but that the sky actually is. Okay, so now here's my little history of Perseus. So this is uh, from one of my favorite astronomers, uh, Barnard, who took these huge wide field optical images of the sky that believe it or not, telescopes today would have a really hard time taking because the field of view of modern telescopes is much smaller. So this is a tremendously wide field image of this region in the constellation Perseus that has all this dark black stuff in it. And there's a wonderful line in his paper that says something about, as I have most definitely proven, these are not vacancies in the distribution of stars. They're obviously dark crud, I'm paraphrasing, along the way to the background stars. And that's why this looks black. And so this, a hundred years ago, he was trying to convince other astronomers that there was a lot of stuff out there in space. And he even knew eventually, um, if you look at these sort of bright stars with all this nebulosity, they tend to be near these dark regions. And so he even thought that those dark regions had something to do with star formation, the formation of new stars. And he was right, but that's not what this talk is uh, today. Instead, I'm just gonna use this region to show you a bunch of much more modern techniques um, to look at it, okay? So we went from, Ptolemy in 100 AD to Galileo in 1600 AD to Barnard in 1900 AD. Okay, and now we're gonna just zip forward. Uh, now we're that was that was the fastest history ever. Okay, so now we're in like the 1980s, right? And and things were, you know, they changed a lot in the 30 years from when I was in college to when I was, you know, uh, 10 years ago or whatever. Um, we won't say how old anybody is uh, old anyway. Uh, but the general idea was the same. It was a lot of 2D images with a lot of annotation on them and some clever use of color. And so if I just go around here, this is all from a paper actually that John Bally led about Perseus um, that has the original sources of these images in it in case you're interested, okay? So this one is just a classic combination where a grayscale map is combined with a contour map. Now, the interesting thing that I'm going to show you in a minute is that these contours, I'm just guessing that everybody watching this is familiar with what a contour map is, okay? And the best thing that a contour map is representing is 3D data, where this is like, you know, contours of a mountain height or something. But what I'm going to tell you later is that this is not 3D data, it's 4D data, and you're actually missing a dimension. Do it like this, but it's pretty sophisticated, so it's all right. And then you see they're using a different technique, the grayscale, to try to show how the contours fit in with the stuff that's measured by the grayscale. And you see one wrapping around the other, so that's very good. 
And then in here, you see a scale bar, um, which also happens a lot in astronomy when people do a good job. Okay. And over here, you see the kind of thing you see on Astronomy Magazine. Uh, you know, it's a really beautiful multicolor image. <laughs> to astronomers, those colors mean a lot. Sometimes they're quote unquote real color in that they represent sort of the color of the photons that would actually be observed. And then, of course, other times they're completely false color. But I point out that this also has this kind of annotations in the style of of you know, arrows and lines and letters, which works well when there's sparse information, but absolutely terribly when there's a lot of information. So we'll get back to that later. And then down here, here's another grayscale image map with some annotations. And if you look really carefully, there's a lot of little dots. And I'm gonna show you some more images of Perseus in a minute where you can barely see the dots. And one of the problems I didn't mention in astronomy is that there's a huge dynamic range in scale that you wanna show a lot. So just simple, trivial things like dots disappearing are often a problem um, in the visualizations. You know, being able to distinguish small dots, uh, you know, so that they're small enough to distinguish them, but actually be able to see them um, so they're big enough for your eye to see them. And then, you know, here's a figure where you see some color-coded red and blue vectors uh, on top of some filled contours, but you get the general idea. Like, these are figures that were chosen to be in a review article. So... They're not terrible, but they're not, um, you know, earth shattering either. Okay, you know, for for 1987 or something, you know, some of them were earth shattering, but for now, none of them are earth shattering. Okay, so this stuff here, uh, which Michelle Borkin, who's one of the other speakers uh, today, thank you, Michelle, is going to talk more about things like this, was very. Uh, involved in all of this. Uh, it started with her undergraduate thesis, uh, this work, um, and. We started a project uh, at Harvard a long time ago called Astronomical Medicine uh, that used medical imaging software. So for those of you who know uh, 3D Slicer and uh, the whole VTK and ITK ecosystem, we used that stuff uh, starting in around 2005 to try to apply it to astronomy data. And ultimately, here are just two examples of uh, what we produced. On the left, I'll show this to you in an animated way in a minute, um, is one of these renditions of the giant amount of gas that Barnard imagined was blocking out the light of stars, but could never possibly have seen, uh, certainly not in three and four dimensions that I'll show it to you in, in a minute. Um, and I'll explain how we added the techniques that you see there uh, marked in color. And then on the right uh, is something that was considered very innovative for its time, but I'm going to show you some stuff today that's better. Okay, so 10 years ago, we published the first 3D PDF in nature, an interactive PDF, and uh, that was great, but I'm going to show you the limitations and, and how I think we can overcome them. So let me start with that first image. And again, if this was an astronomy talk, I would tell you much more about what all this means, but I'm just going to pretend that you don't care, okay? And that this is, so I'm just gonna tell you that this is the Perseus star forming region. This is what the kind of thing Juno was talking about. Again, if this was a different talk, I would talk about the difference between what I call wide data or diverse data and big data, okay? So big data is, you know, at least it was this buzzword five years ago and people are all worried about the volume of data, but actually in my experience, that's handleable. And it's the diversity of data and combining different data sets is where the real power in scientific discovery comes from. So anyway, this is a list of many different data sets. And so you see the kinds of things that we were talking about before, the points, the little tiny points are hard to see. There's some contours, there's a color image. There's also a black and white image. There's this little cube, which is suggestive of something I'm gonna talk about later. And what I didn't tell you is that these green contours, again, this is all you need to know for today. And if you're interested in the astronomy, ask Michelle or me later. Okay. But the green contours are actually the sum of stuff along the line of sight that you're not seeing in this image. So one way to see that stuff is to just make a movie of it. Right. And so let me do that again. Hang on. Let's do that again. Let me try to, now I'll make the movie interactive this time. Let's see if I can get this to work. Come on, hang on. Keynote does that thing, you know, where sometimes you can control the slider and sometimes you can't. <sighs> Come on. Thank you, Apple. Well, I'll just have to let it play. This is gonna be the non-interactive version. Okay, so if I can just let it play, hang on. Whoops, sorry. Wow, I think. 
please. All right. Well, if you just look at that, I'll just play it one more time. I'm going to drive you crazy. Sorry. Okay. So I'm going to show you that here. By the way, to any of you who want to use a slider in your keynote presentation, I think there's something funky going on with uh, Zoom. Anyway, so you see this white fluff kind of moving across the screen. The sum of all that white fluff is the green contours. Okay, so you're losing whatever that three dimensional information that the white fluff is telling you about. Again, I'm hoping Michelle will explain that if this was medical imaging, those would be like sections, different depths into someone's brain or into someone's heart. And a, an expert at anatomy could put that back together into a three dimensional picture. Okay? But astronomers, as brilliant as we are, uh, cannot put that back together into a three dimensional picture. And so here's just a movie uh, from something that was actually interactive at the time, although not as interactive as we wanted, of what that means, what that white fluff looks like in a real three dimensional space. It's a space of two dimensions on the sky and one of velocity. But again, that, that's too much astronomy for today. So never mind. But just to give you, you know, the power of what's going on here, if you tried in the standard way to understand what's going on with this material by just looking at this white stuff going through, it's extraordinarily hard to figure out what to do with that third dimension. But if you just do something that's been possible for, I don't know, 40 years, right and make an actual three-dimensional image the whole thing much makes much more sense and you discover all kinds of structures uh, that had never been seen before and uh, you understand what the stars that are forming in the cloud actually do to the cloud again michelle can tell you about that if you want okay so that's you know sort of the state of the art circa 2008 2009 and so in order to publish that stuff was very challenging so I was lucky enough to be at one of these SciFu meetings with Phil Campbell, who was the editor in chief of Nature. And I told him that we had recently learned we could potentially embed this kind of stuff in a PDF. And long story short, he asked us to do it. And we published this paper called A Role for Self-Gravity at Multiple Length Scales and the Process of Star Formation. Again, I'm doubting you're interested in what self-gravity is doing in star formation today. Okay, but I will show you um, what this 3DF, 3D PDF did and, in a second. And I just want to point out that what we really want is to connect the analytics that are in these plots to the demonstrations that are in these 3D volumes. Okay, and but what you're going to see does not do that. And then I'm going to show you in a minute how to actually do that. Okay, so here's just a quick demo of the paper. You can still go do this. You can get the paper from Nature's website. Um, you can notice that it says you know, click to rotate, which by the way, it says even in the printed version on purpose, you can ask me what later, why? Okay, and so you can just click and drag. And again, to people from the Viz community, this is not that impressive. To people in astrophysics, this is still very impressive, okay? And so, um, you know, and you can turn layers on and off and you can give people different views of the data. But again, what's important is that the stuff down here at the bottom, okay, these are the segmentation algorithm results that are giving you these pictures, but these two plots are not connected. Okay? So what do we really want? Uh, we really want what John Tukey wanted in the 1970s. Okay? We want fully uh, linked views of all of the data sets that we want to look at at once. He was thinking about one data set at a time. I'm going to be greedy and say I want as many data sets as I want at a time. And we want to be able to highlight salient features like pieces of that tree diagram and see where they are, for example, in those volume renderings, right? And so there was nothing that could do this in 2010 uh, when we were done with our software. I have six minutes left, Juna, on my clock here, so I'll, I'll take them. Okay, so anyway, um, so uh, we, we made something, uh, and I'm really, there's a lot of we. Please look at the bottom of the screen to know who we are, okay? Uh, we made this thing called glue uh, that, again, Michelle is going to talk about a lot. Uh, and what you see in the upper left corner here is actually uh, Perseus. Again, but this is all the same data that we had in the mid and late 2000s that you can put together, combine all the different data sets, link them together uh, in one software package, and then you can select things across all the different open views and all the different data types. Michelle, nod at me if you're going to explain how to connect all the data sets. Yes. Okay, I'm going to skip the, the demo video. Are you going to show the demo video later? 
Good. Okay. We're going to skip, uh, we're going to skip the next slide, but the point is all of these things. Okay. Can now be done uh, inside of one package that actually plugs in a bunch of other packages in order to work. Okay. So I want to highlight just two more things about Perseus. So this is glue now outputs to uh, JavaScript. Uh, and in this particular case, uh, this is used. Uh, this uses something called Pi Vista. Uh, this particular visualization is in an upcoming paper by Catherine Zucker, who actually also made the uh, visualizations that you see here. And so this is just JavaScript in the browser, and you can see it's very fast, um, and it lets you have a fully interactive view of the data. And then, of course, we publish, and this is interactive too. We publish the data along with the visualization, so people can go beyond even what they see. And so the thing I really want to show you in a minute is the augmented reality view, uh, which I think is actually the best way uh, to see um, to see what is uh, actually three dimensional in three dimensions. Okay, so we're gonna just say that I wanted to plug in, haha, <laughs> plug the plugins. Okay, so in glue here, you can actually add a lot of things. And so some of the other projects that we'll hear about today, so there's Warwick Telescope, which I mentioned, and Open Space, and then there are actually also plugins in the works for Aladdin, ESA Sky, and YT. What I mean by plugins is that there's certain features that come with Glue. Again, Michelle might explain this. And then to customize it for different fields, for example, astronomy, you can plug in all these other modules and you can control it um, from Jupyter Notebooks or Jupyter Lab. So finally, let me just, I'm going to skip this. You can ask me later. And I just want to talk about art to conclude. Okay. So on the left, I think you recognize Michelangelo's David and the, the, the Da Vinci's Mona Lisa on the right. And there are two ways that people show you three dimensions. One is to make a sculpture, which is actually three dimensional. The other is to do the lighting and everything just so beautifully that it looks three dimensional. And so this is the thing from yesterday. This is the astronomy picture of the day. It has this beautiful lighting, which you can call sfumato in Italian, but it still doesn't quite look three-dimensional. Um, when this was put in the American Museum of Natural History show, uh, they actually used the real three-dimensional data. And you notice if I scroll through this, you kind of get a sense of what's going on in three dimensions, okay? So is that sculpture, is that like real 3D? I don't think so. Okay, not quite, but your brain is fooled extremely well by the combination of motion and occlusion. Okay, but you really are relying on memory. So in order not to rely on memory, uh, we've now made it possible to put three dimensional data, including Perseus, okay, onto a virtual reality cube, I'm sorry, an augmented, importantly, augmented reality cube, or onto a tabletop. So I'll just show you, if you scan these codes, maybe you should do it at home because I'm running out of time. I was going to show you live. I'll show you during the questions. How about that? Um, but there you go. That's what it looks like. If you want Perseus to float above a printed paper of Perseus right there on my kitchen table. Um, and if you would like instead to see it on a virtual reality cube, these are what, this is what would happen if I gave you a demo. I scan this code. It opens on a blank space. I put the cube in front of the code and suddenly I'm holding the whole star forming region in my hand which is kind of amazing. Okay, so that dinging, oh, by the way, we wrote an NSF proposal for those of you who are reviewers for the NSF CSSI program, you want to pick this one because all the American Astronomical Society papers that could have augmented reality figures in them will then have augmented reality figures in them. And Michelle is gonna do an amazing usability study to make that all work out really well, okay? So people often see stuff like that and think that it's for outreach. But again, Michelle and Tom Robitaille and I have written a paper, which is on the archive, that talks about how these tools can actually be used. Even for the actual data analysis, you can output graphs that are for scholarly publication or for public outreach. And then when they get recycled through citizen science, this modular architecture and the open source world, you wind up with a really nice ecosystem. And the most beautiful example of that I was gonna show you was the Radcliffe wave, but I don't have time so go Google Radcliffe Wave. And I will tell you that um, Arzu gave a great plug yesterday for the blog that she and I uh, created called 10qviz.org that lets people who are not visualization experts for the most part, look at these questions to try to get started. So that's pretty much what I wanted to say. I'll just tell you that the two challenges I would talk about are to 
deal with having many, many, many different data sets that you could glue together, but you can't handle when there are a thousand of them. So you have to treat a case as a variable. And then the other problem is even with tools like this, 3D selection of features in a manual kind of interactive way is still a huge problem. And I will stop there with 43 seconds over. Sorry, thank you very much. <laughs> okay. Oh, wait, did people not see that? No, we did. Wait, the people watching? I'm so confused. I can't see. What? So we're now going into our, now we're going into the, the Q&A, but don't worry, Alyssa, we'll give another opportunity for you to share that. You were not on the YouTube channel. The people in the Zoom saw it, but the people who oh. are, 100 people who are watching right now missed that cool demo. So we <laughs> will have another chance to catch up, but let's just get some questions okay. um, and then uh, and then we'll let you share that demo again. Sure. Um, so Alyssa, you mentioned that you thought the big challenge for astronomers in the future is dealing with the high dimensionality of all the combined big data sets. Um, mm -hmm. What considerations do you think all these large surveys should be taking in order to more easily allow for connections between data sets? Well, that's actually a pretty easy question, actually. Um, so they should, uh, first of all, the metadata that everybody thinks is so boring is super, super important. So in other words, having a format that other people can understand and documenting what the data mean uh, is really important. And then also having the data be available in a lot of different formats and not on ridiculous websites where you have to like type in coordinates for every kind of search you want. And so basically finding out what tools your community uses anyway, which is probably some large set, subset of the Jupiter ecosystem and AstroPy and things like that, and then having search tools from within those um, interfaces. So in other words, don't, don't roll your own is, I guess, the simplest way to say that. Um, and so you've shown a lot of tools that astronomers have built um, for visualizations coming together in sort of these systems of systems, yes. um, especially with glue. Yes. Um, and I feel like this is really great because it's a tool that becomes much more approachable because you only kind of need to learn one tool to access many. Um, and so what do you think is the main drive that made that possible? I feel like maybe time and money are the obvious you answers. You were dropped out. What do I think is the main what that made that possible? Drive, like that made it possible for the developers to come together. Oh, well, I mean, a lot of the developers already worked together. And so the developers don't actually work 
together on this. In other words, there's this AstroPy community uh, that there's a lot of people, a hundred and something people that contribute tools there. And then a lot of people on this Zoom are friends with each other. And so you don't actually need, it's, it, we, we never want to give people the impression that Glue is some giant monolithic program the way IDL was or IRAF or something like that. It's, it's an ecosystem to connect things and it's pretty well documented. And so people make these plugins and, and actually the problem is not discovering people people's plugins when they make them. And so we could actually use better uh, organization for that kind of thing. Um, so the answer, I mean, the, the desire for this came from data like what you saw, like from the complete survey of Perseus um, that you saw from 15 years ago. And we were, I was originally using Datadesk for those of you who know what that is. And then Chris Beaumont, who was the original architect of Glue wrote a uh, data desk for 3D images uh, in IDL, which cost $1,000 a copy. So he clearly didn't want to do that, but it was a proof of concept. And then Tom Robitaille uh, taught Chris Python in a couple of days. And then Michelle gave him some idea how to do a nice uh, interface and user studies. And then the whole thing kind of evolved after the James Webb Space Telescope decided that Glue should be like the official software for visualization of JWST and started off by giving us kind of a million dollars to get going. And the rest is, as they say, history. But I'm not sure that's what you wanted to know. Oh, that's great. Thank you. So I'd like to give Alyssa an opportunity to share the demo that she shared with uh, the presenters to all of the YouTube folks. So let's um, let's move to uh, Alyssa's demo, and then we will uh, and then we will go on to our next speaker. By the way, if people do have more questions, please put it in the Discord channel, and we will keep tabs on that. Uh, and, and convey those questions um, throughout the day. So just because a speaker isn't on doesn't mean you can't ask that speaker questions. Sure, sounds good. Okay, hang on. So you guys see now, now everybody's seeing this? Okay, if it works twice, you know, then it's like a really good demo, right? Okay, so here you go. So this is unpublished data uh, that is showing you actual three-dimensional structures. Uh, that's what you see in green. And uh, what you're supposed to be seeing here is that that huge semi-transparent sphere kind of connects these sets of structures. And I can't remember either the blue one or the pink one is Perseus that you saw before. We don't have annotations in here yet. I think it's the blue one. Um, anyway, and so I can scale this. I can put it down on the table and it's still there. Oop, but not if I put it in the shadows. There we go. <laughs> put it over there. And I can just zoom in and out with my hands or I can zoom relative the, the size of the cube. So that is that. So it really works. And I can also make it hover over the table, but I don't want to take other people's time. Thanks. Well, thank you so much, Alyssa. Um, it was really fantastic. And, uh, and Alex Bach, will you please share your screen? Thank you all. And you should all listen to Michelle because she's going to finish telling you all the great details and more. Um, so Alex Bach uh, is, we're, we're very excited to have Alex here talking with us. I know many of you guys know him from, um, uh, from, uh, from, from the visualization community and for the astronomers among you who know Alex, he's one of the lead developers of Open Space, which is an incredible resource both for uh, education and public outreach as well as for professional astronomers. Um, he's currently joint uh, in a dual, uh, a dual appointment between Ski Utah and Lin Chopping uh, University. And so we're, we're really delighted to have Alex with us. He is um, uh, really special in uh, connecting these communities. Alex, please share your screen. Great. It should be on. Showing my webcam, I just see. waiting for feedback. I see your I see your slides, but I do not see it shared with the uh, with the with the broader world. So there are 101 people who are dying to see your slides. So uh, maybe uh, there they are. It? Yep, great. <laughs> okay, then I, so then I'll get started. So uh, yes, welcome. Um, Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Uh, my name is Alex Bock, and as uh, Juna mentioned, I'm uh, both at Linköping University and the University of Utah. And uh, currently, my main focus is on uh, developing, um, or like leading the development on the uh, open source software, OpenSpace. And uh, particularly for this um, 
for this uh, yeah, occasion, uh, what I wanted to talk about was uh, how we are trying our little part in bridging the gap between the existence of very sophisticated expert tools, um, bringing them over into planetariums, living rooms, and other kind of uh, environments. So uh, as a bit of a context for everything, um, our grand idea for open space was uh, recreating and uh, this time an open source browser of the of the entire cosmos and uh, open source of course in order to uh, get the the widest amount of uh, outreach hopefully uh, getting some other people participating in it and put, um, uh, contributing code to everything and essentially creating what is a large scale multi-model visualization engine um, focused at the moment on astronomy data but uh, the really important part here is that it is contextualized because for all kinds of data, as nice as there are, if the, the proper context is missing, it's almost meaningless to look at data from, a, from the public's point of view. All researchers, they have kind of their, their context built in into their brains and can uh, um, extrapolate that. But in order to, to display data sets for the general public, we really need to um, bring that context to pe for people. So, Three of the, um, the, um, the, the target domains that, we, uh, that we're targeting are um, space missions, uh, different kinds of observations and simulations and bringing them all together and displaying them on a variety of different display devices. So here on the right, you see flat screens, uh, fisheye rendering, which is half uh, occluded, uh, but then also display walls. And it's all about what Elisa already started mentioning. It's about the combination of merging this explanatory visualization and the exploratory part of the visualization. And that is all for science communication and outreach. And I think it all, the, the best summary of this is actually this slide. So here we have two visualizations of Mars, uh, both done within open space and uh, both of basically the same data sets. Um, on the left hand, we have a, um, a small kid, a, a, young, a young child what, uh, that was walking up to one of the public installations uh, in New York that we were having. Um, he was picking up a game controller and flying around Mars and looking at all of the, all of the data sets that we have, was flying down to Mount Olympus, et cetera, and like, looking at a marvel at the data more, more precisely. And then on the right hand side, we have uh, Jack Mustard, who's uh, on the science definition team of the um, Perseverance rover. Um, and they are looking at some of the CRISM data sets using exactly the same algorithms. So just by changing your, your frame of approach to the data, you can get vastly different um, results from the same kind of software. And this kind of like, replicates of what we really, really want to do. So open space is a collaboration between a number of partners. So it was started uh, here at Linköping University and in collaboration with uh, close collaboration with the American Museum of Natural History in New York. Um, and then we got uh, other partners on board uh, very early on the NASA Goddard Space Flight Center, uh, the Ski Institute and uh, Tenden, Tenden School of Engineering at uh, New York University. So one thing to keep in mind for all of our software is that we're, di we're dividing our user base into three different categories. So on the one hand, we have the users. Those are the people that are standing in a planetarium making use of the data sets and explaining complicated topics to the wider audience. This can be in a planetarium, but it doesn't have to be. And this is also people that just download the application and start using them on their own uh, in order to explore the cosmos. Uh, on the other hand, we have the, uh, the builders in the center. Those are the people that make use of the already implemented features in order to create something new. So this would be uh, an example of this, for example, would be uh, adding a new model for a spacecraft and showing the trajectory of that spacecraft. And then on the, on the right side, we have the developers, which are actually going into the nitty gritty parts and implementing something completely new. This most of the times is some visualization research, but also more engineering challenges. This, of course, uh, it takes a village to do that. So here I have a list of all of the people that over the past seven years now have contributed to open space. Uh, at the bottom, we have all of the master thesis students, uh, four of which I'm gonna be highlighting during this presentation. And uh, yeah, it's basically on the backs of these students that have done tremendous amount of work um, that most of open space has been uh, constructed. So as I said, we want to support different display systems. And here's one of the videos that I was uh, 
presenting last year at Viz, where we were talking about how to how to actually achieve that from a systems point of view. With all of this support um, that we got, we, uh, we were able to uh, um, get a lot of planetarium partners on board. So here is just a like a brief overview of all of the, the planetariums that, uh, or some of the planetariums that uh, have installed open space and are using it on a somewhat regular basis to uh, explain things to the public. Um, but uh, there's more of them coming on basically every day almost. And uh, we're very, very happy that it's taking, yeah, taking somewhat up, uh, uptake so that we can bring in the science to the general public. And that's basically what it's all about is to, to educate the next generation in order to get them excited about the science and get them, yeah, get them interested into, into participating and joining the STEM fields. So in order to do that, we had to uh, uh, tackle a couple of different challenges, um, ranging from uh, the different spatial and temporal scales, which uh, there exists a paper about, uh, to the variety of data sources, which we're going to talk about in this, uh, in this talk, uh, but then also collaborative experiences that I'm going to explain uh, in a bit. And then let, lastly, if we want to run in public installations, there is a requirement for the flexibility and robustness of the software as well, of course. And this I'm going to explain uh, on the basis of three different use cases that uh, that we're using, or that, that that I want to highlight. So number one, uh, we want to make use of open space as a tool for astronomy research. And this is the most um, the most applicable to to this workshop. So this is why I'm going to start and end with this. Um, and as one of the examples, I want to highlight the uh, the work of two of those master students, uh, Christian and Emily, who. Uh, who are still actually currently still writing up their thesis work. Um, but um, we were using their tools for creating a public program in order to show the effect of the radiation coming out of the, uh, out of the sun and looking at uh, coronal mass ejections and so forth. And uh, all of that data um, was provided to us um, by Predictive Science Inc. And with the help of uh, NASA Johnson and NASA Goddard, um, we, were, we were able to put together a program at the museum um, to explain this actually very, very complicated subject matter in a very intuitive way. So here I have a, um, a, a screen grab of the, of the event. So we're looking at the sun, which you can see here on the left, and um, we're looking at the so-called Bastille Day event. So that's, uh, that was happening on the 14th of July in 2000, and it is one of the most studied um, solar events. So we're seeing on the sun a magnetic uh, magnetogram, which was used as an input to drive a simulation that you can see here, both represented as a volumetric rendering and as, a as field lines and these node diagrams. I'm not going to go into the details of that, but the talk is online, so uh, I would refer to that. So as I said, there's a screen grab, so we have the lower thirds from the screen grab still in there. but. Uh, that works. So um, basically, it was like an hour program where um, John John Linker, the expert, was basically talking everyone through what is actually happening and being able to show how the uh, the highly energetic particles um, were, yeah, spewn out from the sun and were, um, yeah, make their way to the to the Earth and what impact it has on the magnetic field and so forth. So the 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 reason why I want to to highlight this and show this is that. John Linker, as a domain scientist, and in this case, Leila, uh, they're very, very closely integrated with the development of the visualization that was happening by Emily and Christian. And this tight collaboration is immensely useful, but it also takes a large amount of time. This is kind of one of the, one of the, 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 the potential problems with building this bridge, that not everyone has enough time to actually sit down for a month or two in order to design this kind of new visualization. So that's why we have to make it as easy as possible in order to, uh, uh, to foster this more, uh, this collaboration better. And if I jump a bit forwards, we can see how all of those particles moving to, towards, this, towards the earth and it's kind of cool, but also informative. Um, the second uh, use case that I want to talk about is uh, outreach in different planet in planetariums, exhibitions, classrooms, etc. I'm not going to talk too much about this because I'm, uh, Jackie will uh, will talk about the Gaia data set, but uh, um, also 
had to put in a picture of Juna. Um, so this is one of the, uh, the uh, in the background, you see one of the videos of this, of the old Sloan database, which, uh, which we're also visualizing in 3D and making, explaining to the people the 3D structure of it. But then also having more uh, entertaining uh, outreach opportunities. So the third use case is um, showing how mission visualization is actually happening. Um, so we want to show how different spacecraft are traveling through the through the solar system, how they're actually doing their operations, and uh, yeah, transmit that information and that knowledge to the public that is watching. So in this case here, we're seeing uh, a visualization of the Mars inside landing in real time um, that we put up online. Um, but it all started. Uh, with the New Horizons spacecraft back in 2015. So here we took the spacecraft model and placed it in, in its correct location and then visualized what the instruments were doing at each specific, specific uh, time. So here in the top image, you're seeing that yellow little triangle thing that comes out. That is the field of view of the LORI camera on board New Horizons. So at the time of the flyby, we were showing what the spacecraft was doing exactly in that moment, which pictures that it was taking, because that was all planned years ahead in the, in, in the past. Um, and we were basically getting everyone on board on, yeah, on the idea that this is the science that it is happening at that moment while we were looking at it. Of course, a lot of time has passed since. And uh, four years later, uh, New Horizons plus flying past uh, its next target, um, PT-1. And uh, here in the bottom, we have an image of that. Of course, it was flying much further apart, much further away from it. So we have to like, enhance the image. The reason why, I want, why I'm showing all of this is that we were sharing this experience with about 1,000, 1,500 people all around the world that were all sitting in their own planetariums and in their own homes and looking at a live stream of everything that was happening. So at the time of the flyby, precisely at the time of the closest approach, we were having a live stream with, um, part, with people from the mission and they were explaining what their instruments were doing, what images were being taken at that moment and basically providing the grander context of what people were seeing. Because if I go further, you can uh, see here that we didn't actually at the time see that much because the images were not sent back yet. So everything was basically just green squares, um, which is visually not that appealing unless it's explained in its proper context. And uh, this was building on one of the, um, yeah, on one of, one of the software systems in open space that we, that we have since uh, expanded on, which uh, we call now astrocasting, where we take the, the input from a single host send that to a server that then distributes it to a number of other peers that are each rendering everything according to their own geometry. And this is one of the, um, the ways how we were able to get so many people on board without overloading their internet connection, without pre-rendering everything and so forth. So for example, on the image on the slide before, you, were see you saw that uh, one of the planetariums that we were supporting was in Accra in Ghana, and the internet connection wasn't really that good. So streaming video, for example, was basically out of the question. So and this, this served as a very nice, uh, yeah, essentially compression method. OK, so now coming back to the, uh, to the first use case, um, of uh, making use of, of building the bridge between expert tools and the public. Because as you've probably seen during, throughout the presentation, it's, it usually it's involves a lot of effort and a lot of time to get domain data into a software system that is at the moment at least primarily designed for displaying data to the public. So the, the, a large amount of work within the last year has been dedicated on trying to remedy that. Um, and well, the first approach that you might think might be quite good is just, why don't you just implement all of the available visualization techniques? And that's, as you saw in Alyssa's talk just before, it's quite a lot. Uh, and that is not really feasible uh, because there are a lot of expert tools out there that can 
that can be used to uh, to a very high degree in order to get some kind of in insight out of data and like replicating that and making a, a poor second version of that it doesn't really help anyone because the the muscle memory of using the application by the expert is gone. Um, all of the data has to be rec replicated anyway, so there is not really any benefit from it. Um, so essentially, it comes down to that we need to be able to interoperate between different applications. Um, here, the problem is one-on-one -on -one interoperability is not really feasible because, well, essentially, we're going to end up with an n squared combination of all kinds of applications, which is like a lot of work and a lot of overhead in order to gen to uh, um, yeah to basically uh, maintain and also to to generate in the first place. So instead of doing one to one interoperability for everything, what uh, we wanted to do is basically use a common uh, a common a common uh, protocol in order to communicate between these different applications. And at first we were looking at uh, the SAMP protocol, the simple application messaging protocol, which is uh, used a lot in AstroPy. Um, unfortunately, that wasn't really that easy to, to make going under Windows, which is our pr primarily platform. And the even bigger problem is that it's not really geared towards interactive software. So um, all of the data sets have to be serialized, which particularly if we're looking at very large data sets, that's incredibly slow. I mean, from a visualization point of view, incredibly slow i'm thinking about like sub second still but uh that that is not really uh feasible i think um same problem handles with vo tables which is an xml based representation um but th that has essentially the same problem so here is where the second uh, set of master students come in which is uh um, anisa bihi and johanna granstam who are doing also currently doing their master thesis and uh whose job it was to come up with a better messaging protocol in order to facilitate uh, this interoperation. And they were um, primarily focused on making open space work together with Glue, which I'm going to demo in a, in a short moment. So this one's a binary messaging protocol. And as I said, they, they work primarily on open space and Glue, but it's not limited to that. So if we flip over here. Should probably put that up. There we go. Okay, so I think this should all be working. Yes, good. Um, so here on the left hand side, we have open space, which is real time. I can zoom out, we can uh, look at all of the, uh, the Tully data sets, the Sloan data sets. It's all there in its proper context. The stars are missing, and I'm going to explain that in a second. And here on the right side, we have glue running. So what I want to do here now very quickly is just to show how we can load one of the current exoplanet databases into open space and manipulate it uh, and vice versa. So if I'm going to start with, uh, this is not going to be a glue tutorial, uh, but uh, I think everyone can just follow along. So if we're looking at the data set that we have as a 2D scatter plot um, at first, Let's look at the RA deck representation of this. So here we can see a representation of the exoplanet database. So we, or yeah, the current one that I downloaded this morning. Um, so we have the spiral of the Milky Way over here, and we have this little blob over here. Probably a lot of people already know what it is, but uh, in just in case, we can, if we want to see that it's actually what we think it is, if I select this and I make the points a bit bigger, what would actually help is so if I uh, drag in the open space viewer, um, this one we should probably do before. So we map the RA to RA, the deck to deck, and as the distance, we use the system distance, the details again. As, as Alyssa said, I assume that no one cares, but uh, we can connect this. So now we have the subset. And if I start zooming out, you can already see one red dot. So here we have all of the, the subsets that I just selected. And well, as 
as I said, some people might know this is the 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 initial Kepler data set that we were that we we're looking at. So now I have the subset here. I can change the the color if I want. Um, I can go into into open space and change it the other way around as well. So. So whatever I do, it, get re it gets uh, uh, replicated. So now let's, um, let me just look at what I had planned. Yes. So another data sets, uh, another data set is here. should be highlighting now, but there we go. That's the wrong one, but this, this is why I'm not a Glue uh, developer. Um, what I actually want to show is um, one of the, the really nice parts of that we can now do. For instance, if we look at another 2D scatter plot, and now what I want to have a look at is the P num, which is the number of planets. And then we take anything else, which in this case, let's do the stellar mass. So we're seeing a, a highlight over here, which let's take that away. So we're basically seeing like what the distribution is of the different planets. So again, let's take one of the five, um, the, the systems with five planets. And now if we're having a look at um, the table for that. So we see uh, a bunch of different planets and planetary systems. And now, of course, by accident, the one that I uh, that I prepared is not really visible. But uh, if we now, let's see, for instance, if 5.5 five C and C is here. Should make that a bit bigger. So now we're grabbing into, into the database and we can add that planetary system into open space. So here you can see the little blue blob coming close by and we're zooming in. And now we're looking at exactly that exoplanet system um, as it is shown in the database. So, and if I rotate around, we should be seeing the yellow Of course, now the demo gods are killing me, but uh, there. There we go. There is the. We can see what the data set of the Kepler looks from this um, from this place, for instance. And like, again, this is just a very simple connection, but it enables a, a huge amount of uh, of collaboration. So because now that this is working, we can basically take the same thing. And put it into the planetarium and have a have a domain expert like you're going to hear in the next talk um, use these applications in real time and make new discoveries while the public is watching and participating. And I think this is like immensely useful and immensely uh, uh, beneficial. So if I switch over to the presentation again. Just for my last slide because this is uh, basically brings me to the end. I'll be hanging around in the uh, Discord the whole time. Um, as I said, all of the stuff that, we, uh, that we're showing is open source and feel free to, to grab it from GitHub, play around with it, uh, ask us any questions if it doesn't work, but um, particularly the protocol is still work in progress. So there's gonna be changes quite a lot. And with that, I'm happy to get any questions if there are any, thank you.
Cool. Thanks, Alex, uh, for the great talk. Um, I'm going to take chair privilege for a second and ask a question that uh, I have, um, which is that Carnegie has just built uh, this very nice data viz lab um, on our campus, but also for folks that just have laptops. Um, how challenging is it to get open space to work on new hardware and to um, import new data sets? Um, basically getting it up and running on new hardware, if it's just a laptop or a stationary computer, it's basically just a download and then starting it up and you basically have what I was just showing. Um, if it's, for example, some, some bigger VIS lab of like a, um, a power wall or something, then it requires a bit more math and knowledge of our XML configuration file, which is also out and not published yet, but uh, at least the documentation is out there. Um, so that is all doable, but I would say, well, we were setting up a new um, power wall at NYU and it took basically a week to, to get everything from, from cold to up and running. Very cool. And, uh, and what about new data sets? Are those challenging to import into open space? I mean, that's basically all the, the, the crux of all of my talk that with the connection with glue is from, if I put on the open space hat, I don't need to care about getting in the data sets anymore because the great developers at Glue already did all of the work. We, we're tapping into that and making use of the best of both worlds. So having said that, now with Glue, it's really, really easy. Um, before it was a bit more work, but still not terribly much work, but enough that it would be a hurdle, essentially. Awesome. Well, thank those grad students for us. <laughs> I will. <laughs> Um, okay, how do you recommend displaying uncertainties in images, spectra, positions, or is that not really possible yet? Um, so we don't we don't currently do that um, to an extent. So maybe you saw that in the in the exoplanet system. Um, so we have a very first step at displaying the uncertainty in the um, semi-major axes of the exoplanets. So we're showing them as a as a little um, a ring around the most likely position, but that is definitely not enough. And I think there's a lot of potential research on how to display uncertainty in 3D environments. I mean, it's one of the holy grails that people are running after. And I think for very good reason, because particularly once to bring in the domain scientists, displaying uncertainty is almost as important as displaying the real data. Because if, if you show someone the data points and you don't have uncertainty, it's like, it's basically meaningless because it could be anything. So that's one of the things that we really, really need to work on. And I think there's a lot of traction on that. Awesome, thank you, Alex. Uh, and so now I think we're going to uh, transition to Jackie. Uh, thanks again, Alex, for a great talk. Thanks. So it's a pleasure to welcome our next speaker, Jackie Faraday uh, from the American Museum of Natural History with us. She is a senior scientist there and also an alumna of the uh, Carnegie Institution for Science. So it's wonderful to see you uh, see her, her work. You may have seen her on uh, the news. You may have seen her uh, when you've been looking at Manhattan hens. You may have seen her as she tries to hunt down uh, the smallest objects in the universe. Uh, and today she's, uh, she's gonna give us a wonderful presentation of how she's using visualization and astronomy uh, to communicate uh, to a broad audience. So Jackie, take it away. Thank you, Juna. I'm gonna share my screen now. And I uh, want to give fair warning that um, 
there are small children where I am and you may hear them. So I've tried to go to the quietest place that I have, but um, it doesn't always work. So um, hi, everybody on the YouTube world that's watching this. And it's very exciting to be able to present to you today at this, um, at this special session. The title of my talk is Visualizing the Dynamic Milky Way for both science and education. And I'm gonna to touch on some things that Alex just presented uh, giving a little bit more detail on it. And I'm actually going to touch on some stuff that Alyssa was talking about as well. We're all very complimentary in what we're doing. And so specifically, I really want to talk about how um, new astronomical data sets benefit now and can benefit more from visualization tools. And it just as a note, this image was taken at the Hayden Planetarium in, of course, pre-COVID-19 times. Uh, this is me presenting to a, a packed audience of that filled our whole 400 person theater and all of the stars that you're seeing on the screen there, there's a little bit of motion, but they're colored by their chemistry. It was a very rich and beautiful, uh, I think, <laughs> outreach talk, but also had an enormous amount of scientific richness in it that benefits astronomers that want to be in the room and also see and talk about their own data sets. So the thesis of the talk that I'm going to give is really the following mantra. A picture or a video is worth a thousand scientific words. I think this is an underappreciated aspect of scientific research, probably not necessarily to this audience, but one I think that would go towards the general audience of my colleagues in just astronomy, that um, we tend to not appreciate how much a visualization tool could actually help enhance and bring out the scientific questions that you might have. So right now I want to paint for you a picture of the landscape in astronomy and as to why that statement of a picture is worth a thousand scientific words um, applies particularly strongly to astronomical science right now. I'm gonna start with this image. I think this is a phenomenal image that was taken by a friend and colleague of mine, Yuri Boletsky. I was actually inside of the telescope observing when this picture was taken. So it's, it's very dear to my heart. Uh, and this, I show this because this is the field site for astronomers, right? Um, I have colleagues at the American Museum of Natural History that are in anthropology and paleontology. And when they go on their field sites, they get to physically go to remote places. They go to remote um, places in Africa and Asia. They go to physically be in the site where they're digging for something, searching for something, looking for wherever they're gonna find whatever sample that they're looking for. For astronomers, um, yes, this is a telescope, so it's a field site in quotes, but it's really not that what I want you to focus on. It's the space occupied by the sky, nighttime or daytime, doesn't really matter, right? You look up, it's the equivalent of the astronomer's field site. And astronomers, to be able to fully engage in their subfields, research questions, they really require access to this multidimensional nature of what we see when we look up. I want to be able to dig into my research the same way my colleagues can in anthropology and paleontology in the sense that I wanna walk in, I wanna look around, I wanna see what's around the objects that I'm studying. I wanna see it, I wanna look. And so a lot of what we've been doing is using astronomical catalogs, we use algorithms in order to parse through lots and lots of data. But I'd much rather get on a rocket ship, you know, virtually, whatever. We're a ground-based species and I wanna fly to it. I wanna look around and I wanna see what's there. So let me take you through data sets that we have right now. And then I'm gonna take you on one of the adventures that I go on to use visualization tools in my own work. Um, and Alyssa, mentioned this, that the uh, the word big data is used kind of specifically for certain things. And then there's diversity of data. And the error of big data to me, of course, means the actual physical size of the data that we're getting in astronomy right now. But also the diversity of the data plays a huge role in our ability to pull out the scientific questions that we want to answer. And the major uh, mission that I'm going to talk about in the rest of the slides that I have is the European Space Agency's 
Gaia telescope and the catalog of information that it gave us. Why is it so important from a visualization perspective? If you've ever heard me give a talk before, you're probably like, I know what Jackie's about to say. She talks about Gaia nonstop. It's so massive because it is the world's greatest mapping mission. Um, prior to Gaia, which only released its major catalog in um, 2018, so two years ago, uh, we only had the positions and, and um, their subsequent velocities for like 200,000 stars. Gaia shows up and on April 24th, 2018, it drops a catalog of nearly 2 billion three-dimensional positions and velocities for these objects. So uh, that kind of information demands visualization tools. I don't want to play with it in two dimensions. I want to be able to immerse in it. On top of that, we have all of these catalogs coming along that give us temporal variability of things. And the temporal, hang on. Hey, I'm on a, I'm on a call. You guys, okay. Kids, told you. Um, on top of that, there's a temporal variability that we're just getting. And I, I cite here the Rubin Observatory. It's going up on a mountaintop in Chile. 15 terabytes of data a night, 200 pet petadites um, set of images and data by the mission end. And that information we want to have correlated with the Gaia DR2 survey so that we can map, we can look at exactly how things are changing in time, in position, in all possible aspects. Um, these aren't the only surveys either. We've got, uh, Juna is heavily involved, is leading the Sloan Digital Sky Survey's fifth um, mission. Then there's the Apogee and SphereX. They're giving us compositional information of stars. We want to pull all this information together, get on our rocket ship, fly around, and immerse ourselves in the data as we try and solve the problems of the universe or the questions of the universe. They're not really problems. So one of the ways that, um, that I've been doing it is using the planetarium software that we have open space that Alex just went into great detail about. I use it because I was using it for planetarium presentations in order to bring questions of the universe to the general public. So jumping into those catalogs, you can put them in to talk about data and then you start seeing things. So I'm gonna take you through a set of three different videos that I've rendered that tell a couple of scientific stories that I've been particularly immersed and involved in um, publishing papers on. And the first video is going to just show you the immensity of Gaia DR2 data. And I just want to say I've been giving a lot of Zoom talks, so I know that this is going to have a low frame rate, and I apologize for that. Um, and a lot of these videos you can catch on YouTube in a different link, and I can post them in the chat later. This video takes off from the Earth. We move away. For those that wanted to be oriented, I put the stick constellation lines on. And right now, this is the sky pre-Gaia. Now, this, which just got turned on for you, are just a couple million of the stars from Gaia DR2. This video is supposed to overwhelm you in some ways in the vastness of this mapping data. So we're kind of moving away from the sun now. We're on our rocket ship. We're moving amongst these stars and we're gonna kind of shift and move around them and look around. And first time you see this, or the first time that I saw this, I was wowed by it and uh, overtaken. I was also confused. What am I looking at? How, how do I interpret what I'm seeing? The stars are color coded by temperature. That gives you some signatures. And we're just flying by a star cluster, which you should be able to see if my computer doesn't crash, which it may have just done. No, it's still good. We're gonna to go to the second video because it looked like it paused. And I'm just gonna pause this to set it up. So that last video ends with an immense amount of data. So Gaia DR2 took us from maybe 200,000 stars that we had good positional mapping information to 2 billion. And now you wanna parse that, immerse yourself in it and figure stuff out. First thing I wanted to do, know was what stars are moving with what? Who's, who are the families? And so this video shows you not only did Gaia DR2 give us positional information, it also gave us motion. So we can move time forward now at a, oops, at a rapid rate. Let's go back. Um, we can move time forward. And when we do, which you will see in a second, this will start now. Um, 
I have selected a very special subset of stars in this. So I'm kind of moving away, kind of close to the sun again. I'm going to move away maybe to about, um, maybe I'm 50 light years away or something like that. And now have a look at this. I've turned time forward so that you're getting something like 50,000 years a second. So you're seeing the temporal changes in motion, something that your eye unfortunately doesn't allow you to do in the human condition, given that we don't live long enough to see this kind of thing. And what you might be noticing is that this is a special set of stars. Every single one of the stars that I'm showing you here is moving with one other star. So you don't have double vision here. This is a sample of about 180,000 stars that all co-move with each other. So I'll let it play just a little bit um, once again, because one of the things that I look to for this um, the visualization is confirmation for me that what I had found was real. They don't all fly off in different directions. That would make no sense. Um, but I can also find things this way. Yes, you can use your standard algorithms to try and find them, but you could just point and pick them out. And so you're finding them. And also you're seeing things. The separation distribution of these stars becomes naturally evident to you as you're looking at it, you can identify very separated stars. You can actually see small differences in how some of these are moving with each other. And now you can actually step out of this. So this was, this was a paper that, um, it's actually a paper I've been working on for some time. The new sources that we didn't realize before that were co-moving with each other, thanks to Guy Adir too. And now let's move a little bit farther. So now you've found two stars moving with each other. Now, who do they move with? Now, can you find larger structures? So we started with that sample of, you know, 180,000 or so of those just moving with one other, but then you require, okay, I wanna see all the ones that move with anybody else in that group. So how big of a structure can I identify near the sun? So I'm gonna move away from the sun and what comes to life is so awesome. So we're going to move away from the sun here. And now you're seeing the local structure near the sun of stars in how they clump. These are their homes. This is where they came from. This is the remainder of, of all of the star formation that's been happening in the nearby vicinity of, of our part of the galaxy. Uh, and so... You know, this this actually is the result of a different group of Mariana Kunkel and Kevin Covey. They put out a paper that are a lot of really cool 2D video, 2D plots. And then I put it in here and I was blown away. And now I've moved time forward. So not only are we seeing how those structures are look in three dimensions, but you can actually see how they possibly interact with each other over time both forward and backwards. Now, it's a lot of work to dig the science out of here, but I look towards these videos in order to be able to say something about the past, um, the past, present, and future of star formation. The special to that is that all of that was open space, right? Uh, and Alex showed this in his talk. This is glue that you've now seen in your forward view. And open space is a plugin that's right behind it. Uh, and this is me rendering a video. And in it, I was loading up some glue data sets. I was actually doing this for the two master's students that um, Alex just mentioned when they were first starting their project. This is actually gonna run. Um, and I was showing them how we load up the data and then send it to glue um, in order to be able to see the data. Cause this is ultimately what I want. I want both. I wanna be able to see the data sets for the visual complementary aspect of it. But I also wanna be able to play with things the regular way. And what I always fight for is I want all of our tools to kind of stay in their lane. Don't try and do something that you're not supposed, that you're not really meant to be doing or, or at least find the other tool and have them talk to each other. And so that's a great part of what we have done with Glue and Open Space and having them talk to each other. Okay, so end of that is that there are limitations to this. And this is something that we've been working on. The dis, like, this just came up as a question. I'd like to see the error bars. I don't wanna just see, um, I don't wanna just see the positions. I'd actually love to see error cones propagating. 
because I move time forward and the error bar gets bigger as time goes forward. So that's something I wanna work on. I wanna add different aspects of motion. I wanna see what the potential of the interactions between the stars or the interactions with this, maybe even just the potential of the galaxy does. Um, and so there are software limitations that we're working on, but the, the enhancement to the science is, is huge from my perspective. So the last minute, I wanna mention here the following. I take these scientific renderings and I play with them all the time for my own research. I load up anytime I have a new data set because Gaia DR2 has basically changed the face of astronomy by giving us very accurate positions and velocities. I can load any new data set that anybody has either. I sometimes just troll the archives looking for a cool new visualization to just throw up there. I wanna see somebody's data set. They said they found a new structure. They found a new velocity perturbation. We put it in there. AMNH has been taking advantage of this since COVID-19 has shut us down. We've taken our content online. And Alex mentioned this, that we have been doing these, these programs. This is a screenshot of the videos available on the AMNH YouTube. Um, and in it, what you'll see, um, a couple of these that are highlighted here, was that a comet mission that was, we posted it yesterday um the field trip comets solar storms field trip stars and we typically get one to two thousand people watching live a few of us will be in the chat with it and by the time it's posted it'll rise six thousand seven thousand ten thousand views we've had as much as forty thousand views on some of our most popular videos since COVID 19. um so looks like I've lost my ability to change my slide, but I have two more slides to show you. And that is that um, much of what we do in astronomy at AMNH involves our ability to talk to the public. And this scientific content is really precious for that, that we definitely move towards um, getting scientific content on. Oh, there it finally goes. Those are the highlights of the pieces that we have. So I'm gonna close up here um, as I think I'm out of time and wanna leave a minute for question. Um, this is a powerful tool at creating these visualizations with something like open space and open space and plus glue to do your scientific research, but also to generate these amazing educational threads. They can reach students, they can reach general public, kindergarten through 12th grade and beyond. Okay, I'll stop there. Thank you so much, Jackie. There. That was fantastic. Um, and now we will uh, get ready for uh, Q and A. So. Thank Uh, so thank you again, Jackie, for a wonderful talk. Um, I just wanted to say you were getting a lot of love in the Discord channel for how interesting and challenging combining Vera Rubin and Gaia uh, will be. Um, yes. Uh, so one question. Is, uh, oh, go ahead. I was going to say that's a challenge that I think we can do a lot with in the biz world, but it's a challenge. <laughs> Um, okay, so I see you as one of the open space diplomats that's kind of bringing open space to astronomers, especially the Gaia community. Um, so what do you think is the most interesting scientific question you've asked that wouldn't have been possible without these visualization tools? Oh, I don't, so that's the one that wouldn't have been possible. I mean, the thing is that a lot of things are possible. I think they take a lot longer to get to the answer. And 
um, there's things that I was able to see. A good example is actually Alyssa, who came to New York, and because uh, Alyssa is a New York girl and loved the Hayden Planetarium. And so she came, and what we did was uh, we wanted to play with the Radcliffe Wave, which was uh, led by her team, um, Jao Alves, Catherine Zucker, Alyssa, and we wanted to see it with stuff that I'd been playing with, all the young stars near the sun. We kind of just started playing with it, and we plopped them on each other, and we just noticed that they, they line up, they look good. You can see some structure with one and the other, and then that led us to start discussing scientific collaborations and she Alyssa and Catherine worked with a summer student this summer that has an awesome result which I don't think I should say any more about Alyssa but it all started with us walking into the dome loading up the data sets seeing how they line up and then deciding what scientific steps come next. You know, the next part of that would be if glue had been actively easy to work amongst with open space at that point, we could have been easily going back and forth onto the dome, back into uh, glue, then back in the dome, because we're having the collaborative conversations that you need to have when you're all sitting there, like we're on the rocket ship, like we're hovering, you know, somewhere in space, making a decision on what we're seeing. That definitely happened. And I would say it's a very citable example of how SciViz led to what will be soon a cool scientific result. There's a very cool. I can see Alyssa's finger. Uh, and then someone had a question about Gaia uncertainties um, for forecasting future states of clumps. Uh, there'll be some declumping just due to Gaia measurements being imperfect. Can we know or show how long we can watch a cluster before they become important? Yeah, I ask myself that all the time because I run time forward and uh, I work with a lot of stuff that's very close to the sun. So I kind of, I like to say I do spitting distance. It's like the 100 parsec sample, so 300 light years away. If you go beyond that, it gets more complicated because the, um, the error bars start to dominate. And so it's not just an, it's not an easy answer because it's, it's very, very much relative to, you know, the signal to noise of the detection and how significant the motion is. I, I deal with things that have tons of motion because they're very close by uh, and relatively very small error bars because there's bright, they're beautiful astrometric solutions. But if you go out to kiloparsec, two kiloparsecs, three kiloparsecs, now you're You've run out of your ability to do all that much with um, very far forward in time. So it's relative. Um, the three kiloparsec sample, I think, is a is a pretty solid sample. You know a lot about this too, Lauren. We've I feel like this has come out of a Gaia DR2 hack week, the discussions of error bars and how we're um, how we can properly attack them. And I show I feel like you've shown the best visualizations of that. So oh good. I'm glad. It's a lot of it's open. Op, the power of open space at this is is not hard to or is not should not be under minimized. And there was a student that we should I don't know Alex if you mentioned him. I had his picture in, but Adam Anselgard, who was a master's student at Linchaping with um, Alex and another developer Emil, the two of them, the three of them, really made it possible for us to get Gaia on the big screen and Gaia into open space very early on. Um, and for me, it's it's been a career changer because I use it so much to do my science. Very cool. So thank you again, Jackie. Uh, so I realize I think we're like 10 minutes into our break. Um, Junior, Bay, do you want to say something about that? Yeah, so uh, first of all, I just want to thank all of the speakers from this morning. Uh, this is great. I think uh, feel free to go take a bio break, get some food, hang around. Uh, we will start promptly um, uh, with our next talk. And this next session is going to be as exciting as the first session. So uh, please do tune back in uh, after the break. And that is going to be at uh, 2 o'clock Mountain Time. So uh, please. Uh, return promptly. Thanks to all the speakers again this morning and keep yes, up with the conversation in the Discord chat. 
Yeah, I think our Discord chat has been extremely live uh, this morning. We couldn't cover all the questions, but feel free to reply to that. And hopefully um, after the, we also will have a discussion session, which is really focused on how to best uh, build collaborations between computer science visualization expert and astronomers. Um, I think that's one point of discussion, um, but yeah, we'll see everybody back at 2 p.m. Mountain Time. Attention mechanisms have greatly improved the performance of many language models, yet with great power comes increased complexity. In this work, we present attention flows, a visualization that let users interpret the language model's decisions and gain insights into the underlying self-attention mechanism. We also support model comparison that helps to fill the gaps between models in different training stages. As data is changing, our understanding of data should be updated correspondingly. Based on machine learning approaches, we formulate a drip level index to monitor the evolution of multi-source data, which allows users to capture and reason significant changes from time series data. The proposed visual analytics system is called Concept Explorer. More details can be found in our talk. White space surfaces are a novel approach to convey depth in vessel visualizations. The core idea is to shift all additional depth cues away from geometry and to use the usually empty space between the vascular structures. This allows us to display functional parameters on the surface and supporting cues on the background. We will explain how to generate such surfaces and how to use them as a canvas to further enhance depth and shape perception. We have seen many visualizations for tree data structures, but when showing changes in trees over time, some focus on displaying hierarchy, while others highlight their changes. With split streams, we combine two approaches and their individual benefits. We evaluated our method in a user study and consider it a general purpose method for the visualization of dynamic hierarchies. Our JavaScript library is openly available. Several recent studies advocated the use of non-parametric density models for the improved characterization of data uncertainty. The non-parametric models, however, present the challenges such as increased memory and computational requirements. In this work, we propose an efficient non-parametric framework for volume rendering in the context of uncertain data and show their effectiveness in classifications via comparisons with the other statistical models. Thank you.
In our paper, we address the problem of navigating complex multiscale and dense environments, such as these molecular models. We present a technique for browsing a model by clicking on textual labels, which we call hyperlabels. This allows the user to intuitively navigate the hierarchical organization of the model. For more details, read our paper or watch the talk. We propose an interactive ensemble analysis framework that provides flexible interactive exploration of the ensemble data. Time series characteristics of data can be obtained by fast browsing time steps. The region stability heat map view shows the stability of the selected region and provides region adjustment by directly clicking. Deep neural networks are vulnerable to malicious degenerated adversarial examples. This brings high risk in applying these networks to safety critical applications. We develop a visual analytics approach to explain the root cause of such wrong predictions. Our contribution contains a constrained path extraction method, a river based visualization, and a contribution analysis method. Serum graphs are variant of stack graphs with curve baseline, and the main factor affecting its reliability is the sign allurance through a perceptual inconsistency of the orthogonal and vertical direction. Aiming at reducing its impacts, we revisited the baseline formulation and proposed the concept of composition to help the serum graph layout optimization. The results show that our algorithms perform better than the others.
Attention mechanisms have greatly improved the performance of many language models, yet with great power comes increased complexity. In this work, we present attention flows, a visualization that lets users interpret the language model's decisions and gain insights into the underlying self-attention mechanism. We also support model comparison that helps to fill the gaps between models in different training stages. As data is changing, our understanding of data should be updated correspondingly. Based on machine learning approaches, we formulate a drift-level index to monitor the evolution of multi-source data, which allows users to capture and reason significant changes from time series data. The proposed visual analytics system is called Concept Explorer. More details can be found in our talk. All right, welcome back, everyone. This is session two of our Viz Astro 2020 workshop. In the second session, we have three amazing talks coming up. The first one is um, is Matt uh, Turk, and he's going to talk about grammar of analysis for uh, metric astro uh, astrophysical data. And Matt is a professor at uh, UIUC, and um, among all the other sp speakers, he's one of those speakers who work at the intersection of information science and, and astronomy. So Matt, go ahead. Thank you. Hi, uh, thank you very much for uh, having me here. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about a grammar of analysis for volumetric astrophysical data. Um, before I begin, I want to say thank you very much to the organizers for putting this together. Um, thank you very much for inviting me to be a part of this. I am incredibly humbled and grateful for this opportunity. Uh, and, you know, especially considering everything that's going on in the world, I want to say thank you for for putting this together and, and making it as accessible as, as you have. Um, before I start, I'm going to uh, mention a couple people that have worked on uh, some of the things that I'm going to describe. Uh, local to the University of Illinois, um, Samantha Walkow, Medikin Monk, Casper Kavalik, Megan Lang, Jared Coughlin, and Chris Haviland have all had really uh, deep impact on the uh, stuff that I'm about to show. Uh, and in particular, I'll, I'll talk uh, at length about things that Sam has been involved in. Um, additionally, with respect to uh, YT, which I discuss at the end, uh, it's a open source package that's a community of users and developers that goes way beyond uh, the, the core developers and the work that, that happens at Illinois. Um, there are many, many people that have contributed code. Uh, the steering committee is in particular made up of Britton Smith, Medikin Monk, John Zuhone, Stephanie Tonneson, Nathan Goldbaum, uh, me, and Cameron Hummels. And two additional people that have been extremely active lately that I want to recognize before I continue are uh, Clement Robert and uh, Corentin Kadu. So, I'll start out with uh, a blanket statement that I heard in, in 2005 uh, from Stuart Levy, uh, which changed the course of my life, uh, which is, we tell lies to visualize. And the various different ways that this uh, manifests are, are kind of what I want to, to spend some time talking about. Uh, as recently, uh, I have been uh, able to participate in some of the uh, literacy projects that my, my first grader uh, has been engaged in. I've been thinking about the term visualization in a very different way, because that's a key part of what they, they do when they read. Um, so for instance, uh, when you're learning to read, you might read the sentence, the sky is full of stars that twinkle. And we might break that down into its subcomponents. So the sky, and you know, we can imagine a sky, and maybe it's dark out, I suppose. Um, and it's full of stars. Uh, you know, perhaps they're making up this uh, asterism or constellation, uh, and they twinkle. And we progressively add new pieces of information to that as we start to think about it. Um, Oftentimes, the process of cognition around data, particularly from astronomy, uh, operates in reverse. So we might look at something like this, the Orion Nebula, and we want to determine something about that. Uh, and we need to be able to understand where that, uh, where the physical origins of the various different things that we see uh, arise from. Um, 
in principle, the uh, image that I just showed you of the Orion Nebula uh, comes out of some external object, and then it trans, you know, it tra it's transported across space and time uh, all the way to reach your eyeball. And each one of those individual little bits of light that hits your eyeball, uh, you know, is a different wavelength, different energy, and it all combines to form some sort of a, you know, a picture. And what we want to do uh, in astronomy, especially when we approach the theory of of astrophysical uh, uh, phenomena is we want to be able to say something about the reverse. How exactly do we generate things that look realistic to uh, to the human eye? This is a picture I took in a parking lot because I thought clouds uh, in the picture were beautiful. Uh, but clouds are a really good example of a phenomena that we can understand uh, based on uh, forward modeling. So we have a system of uh, in, uh, differential equations that we can apply to the way that fluid flows. Uh, and essentially by uh, running calculations, by running simulations, um, we can start with some set of initial conditions. We can apply these uh, equations incrementally uh, as, as uh, we integrate through our, our system and we watch things develop and we watch things that come out of that. Uh, but the process that we actually go through here, uh, once we have this data, once we have this forward model data, is not always clear. And one of the things that, that I've been working on uh, with uh, Sam Walkow here is, uh, you know, what exactly do people do with this data? When you have an astrophysical simulation, what does someone apply to it? How do they uh, transform those bits on disk into some type of an insight that they can use to advance the state of our knowledge? Um, Sam has been conducting an investigation using uh, data storytelling techniques and particularly into how individual researchers describe their process. And the reason that we've embarked upon this is because we recognize that any given platform uh, will be outlasted by the understand our understanding of the process of visualization, cognition, and how semantics are applied to specific models. And what, we, uh, what we've done is we've uh, conducted a series of interviews where we work with uh, individual researchers to sort of understand how they address their data and what it is that they want to come out of it. And from this descriptive process, uh, we've started to uh, attempt to identify common areas of uh, common or areas of commonality between the different researchers and attempted to convert that into a formalized uh, grammar that we can then uh, apply utilizing visualization techniques. What we've ultimately identified is that there seem to be four particular areas that researchers uh, go through when they are conducting uh, analysis on data, particularly from astrophysical simulations. There's registration, uh, transformation, selection, and reduction. And I'll talk about each one of these in turn, as well as how we can approach the composability of these operations. So registration, you might think, um, you know, okay, that makes sense. That might be how we have two different things that overlap. Um, but it, it's also a multi-step process in the sense that when we run a calculation, um, data gets laid out on disk in, in some manner. And maybe that manner uh, correlates very nicely to the way that the data is organized spatially in some sort of uh, physical space, uh, but it may not. So for instance, uh, the data can be laid out. Uh, the process of registration involves reading the data in, understanding how it is laid out in some sort of logical indexing space, and then finally converting that indexing space into a, uh, into a geometric object, uh, into a geometric layout. But more to the point, um, the very specifics of this uh, registration process are essentially defining an f of x so that we can query some type of a field at a given location in space and we can say something about what the value of each individual field is at each individual location. Now, this applies also to, uh, for instance, discreetly sampled data sets. Uh, so for instance, we might have discreetly sampled data sets that are distributed out through disk. Uh, we can register those for analysis and then apply some type of a uh, function in order to uh, calculate the value of a given field at any location. So this might be, for instance, a, a weighting function, a smoothing kernel. Uh, it could be uh, essentially any mechanism by which we convert the discrete into the continuous. The second operation uh, that we've identified is that of the transformation. So for instance, if you're running a simulation, uh, you might be storing out individual primitive variables. You might be storing out uh, the density, uh, the velocity along different axes, uh, the total energy, the internal energy in, in a given field, uh, in a given uh, location. And 
each one of those fields exists in some sort of a form on disk, but they can also be combined in different ways in order to produce fields that exist in potentia. So as an example, this is an image of a, a galaxy simulation. It's very low resolution, uh, but registration enables us to combine these different fields at fixed spatial locations. So we might have density at a given location, and then we might have X and Y, uh, X velocity and Y velocity. And from this, even though the simulation doesn't store each one of these individual objects, uh, each one of these individual fields, we could construct a transformation that combines them into something like a velocity magnitude. And this can be things like arithmetic operations, uh, local stencils, uh, global stencils, convolutions, and so on and so forth. The next uh, operation that we, we identified is that of selection. And oftentimes uh, we can filter individual points or cells and so on based on uh, characteristics like connectivity, their spatial organization, so perhaps their geometric layout, uh, or the criteria from one or more field values. So returning to our uh, example uh, here, we might have some sort of a spatial uh, field that we can choose and you know we can move it around. And then based on the different characteristics uh, inside that field, we can conduct different histograms and weightings, uh, but we can also uh, apply different care. We can also apply selection criteria based on the connectivity of things. So identifying topologically connected sets, uh, things like the criteria from different field values. So where something is greater than, uh, you know, another value or less than another. Now, the uh, final operation uh, is that of the reduction. And so the reduction is where we essentially uh, apply a multi-step uh, uh, transformation and registration process where we can apply reductions along axes. So the maximum value along the given axes, uh, or perhaps we have some type of an integral that we compute along a path, uh, and also where we can remap into any type of non-trivial manifold. So one example of this might be, for instance, if we were to insert a test particle into a, a calculation and we allow that test particle to be integrated, you know, according to some uh, perhaps locally defined or perhaps globally defined or perhaps even prescribed cat, uh, path, and then we compute the values along that. We're now doing a coordinate transformation as well as a reduction where we're computing uh, individual values in some sort of an accumulation process. And then finally, we can compose all of these different operations. So one uh, very common task in the uh, way that simulations are conducted in astronomy is to, uh, for instance, compute uh, the halo mass function. So you might want to uh, have an individual set of, of uh, dark matter calculations and then compute uh, which dark matter particles are nearby to each other, apply some sort of a density threshold to those individual particles, uh, and then uh, based on their locations, uh, conduct some other type of selection and then ultimately come out with a, uh, a mapping. So in this particular case, we've got data that exists on disk. Uh, it's perhaps laid out in an oak tree or perhaps it's you know, individual particles or something like that. And we apply a registration to this data, which might be uh, irregular. It might be uh, multi-resolution. It may be discreetly sampled. And then on top of this, we apply some type of a selection criteria that is based on uh, an individual location, its nearest neighbors, you know, density thresholds, anything like that. Uh, and then we apply reductions onto each one of those individually selected objects. And then we remap them uh, into a different coordinate space where we uh, take a look at, for instance, the, uh, the, the mass count or the mass fraction of uh, individual halos. So how uh, we do this right now using a platform called YT, which is a volumetric analysis platform. Um, it's an open source Python package that talks to the PyData ecosystem, uh, you know, can read in data from uh, various different things that are commodities and also export into a variety of different visualization platforms. Uh, as Alyssa alluded to, uh, it's been able to export data to Glue. Um, there's also, you know, mechanisms for, uh, uh, displaying via WebAssembly in the browser to do really fast pixelization, uh, pixelization of uh, variable resolution data, uh, and then also integrating with tools like Matplotlib and directly to OpenGL for, uh, for uh, multi-resolution AMR uh, volume rendering. But the thing that it, uh, that, that uh, I want to emphasize is that it supports many, many different data formats, uh, all the way from the very big to the very small. So you can load this up on a uh, any given platform and analyze data. 
uh, but there's a common API for accessing data independent of both the data format on disk and also the discretization method of the, say, simulation. So as an example, um, this is a, a visualization courtesy of uh, John Zahone, where John set up identical initial conditions in uh, Gamer2, which is a grid patch or octree, uh, well, block structured uh, based data format, uh, a repo, which is in the middle, and Gizmo, which is a meshless uh, particle based data format. Utilizing the exact same commands, John was able to extract a slice of the density, and now this can be subject to quantitative and qualitative uh, analysis, uh, utilizing essentially this, this lingua franca for uh, different, different data formats. Um, but as I noted earlier, the longevity of any given platform is certainly exceeded by both the research that we conduct utilizing that platform and also our understanding of how research is conducted that we can uh, glean from that individual platform. So what we're working on now, uh, returning to this uh, this uh, project that, that I mentioned that Sam Walcow has been working on is that we are attempting to uh, understand the entire process from acquisition to analysis and then to application in order to develop understandable information uh, for researchers. And then on top of this, we're working to build out utilizing the four fundamental uh, operations that I, I identified earlier, a mechanism for describing the uh, outputs. Now we're basing this on, you know, some very uh, outstanding work that was done uh, on volume visualization by uh, Shi uh, et al. Uh, from Davis, uh, Vega Light out of University of Washington, Grammar of Graphics, and so on. But uh, I have a and a trivial example here of just generating a set of plots. Uh, but the idea behind this is that we uh, want to uh, abstract away the specific API and instead. Uh, recognize that there's a common set of declarative operations that we can apply to volumetric data. So I want to say thank you. Uh, that is the end of my talk. Um, YT is open source, and I'm very interested in uh, you know collaborations on it. I think the, the rest of the community is as well. And I want to thank again uh, the organizers of this conference uh, and funding from uh, the University of Illinois, the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation, the National Science Foundation, uh, NumFocus, and, and actually the Foundation for Food and Agriculture Research. So uh, thank you very much, and 15. Thank you, Matt, for your wonderful talk. Um, should we switch back to Q&A? Uh, thanks again, Matt, for a great talk. Um, I just wanted to say you were getting some love in the Discord channel for how beautiful the YT gallery is online. Oh, thank you. Um, so I see YT as one of the very productive and successful communities uh, in astronomy for building a visualization tool that um, many astronomers use. So what do you think was the key um, to that success? I think, um, so realistically, I think it was an early mover um, that, that that was a big part of it, that luck was an enormous part of it, that we sort of got in there early. But I also want to emphasize that the, the other people that are involved in the community tend to, um, like I've been extremely impressed with the way that, that the folks that I collaborate with um, are in general kind-hearted, thoughtful, energetic and excited. And it's really been one of the, the greatest pleasures of my life to work with uh, the folks in the community. That's awesome. That sounds very similar to Alyssa's response, I feel like earlier on, where it's really just about the community that you're building and the individual people. Thank you. Um, so we have a question from earlier, but I feel like you might be able to speak to this. Um, so how much of this uh, just kind of like building of our own tools um, in data viz is taking us away from the direction um, of data viz today? He says, I mean, specifically, there are so many new feature rich tools being developed and used by the larger data viz community, primarily for HTML, JavaScript and CSS stack. 
How much does developing our own tools keep us from leveraging the fantastic work being done outside our community? So I, I don't know that I'm qualified to say how much it, it keeps us from that, but I will say that I am extremely excited about the HTML stack. And like um, I got to work with uh, Medik and Monk at the University of Illinois, uh, as well as an, an undergraduate, Nathaniel Clausen, um, on building out tools utilizing a variety of different things in the, the HTML ecosystem. So, you know, pushing WebAssembly uh, for, um, for pixelization and, and, and things like that. And then it was just amazing to me both um, simultaneously how frustrated I was with, uh, with uh, understanding how JavaScript packaging works, but that's more on me, uh, but also the, the incredible excitement with, with being able to utilize all these really awesome tools that are, uh, you know, I, honestly, I think that the operating system that runs inside our web browsers is the most powerful thing that we have for science communication uh, in the sense that uh, everything from mobile devices all the way up uh, seems to be able to, um, yeah, I, I'm just really excited about that. So I, I actually would really like to see a lot more of that. Cool, do you see that being integrated into YT maybe? I hope so, I hope so. Cool. Or I hope to see YT integrating with tools that that do that, like like Jackie, uh, or Dr. Faraday uh, alluded to, you know, the notion of of tools doing what they do and when working in an ecosystem. Awesome, thanks, Matt. Thank you. All right, I think we are ready to switch to the um, second speaker. So let me introduce our second speaker, Michelle. And as we heard from this morning, there's a lot of excitement happening between Glue um, and Open Space and a lot of other um, amazing software tools. Um, so we'll hear all the amazing things uh, with the details of Glue. And uh, Michelle, fire away. Thank you so much for that introduction. It is such an honor and privilege for me to be here. And I'm so excited to see astronomy visualization at Viz becoming more and more prominent. Uh, today with my talk, Bridging Domains and Dimensions with Glue, I'm first gonna give you an introduction to introduce you to me. And many of you don't know who I am, or for those in the Viz community, you may not realize that I'm an astrophysicist by training and passionate about astrophysics and having a whole alternate life you don't know about. Uh, and sort of show you how that feeds into my passion for Viz. And astronomy has such incredible data and we're seeing this with all these other talks, diverse data, variety of data, big data. And I'm hoping that those in the audience who are coming from the more traditional Viz background will be sort of enticed to go talk to their local astronomy colleague after the workshop today in my talk and show some more interest. And there's so much potential for collaboration between these fields. And finally, as I've been introduced a few times over in these other talks, yes, I will be talking about glue and like giving you a little more details about that wonderful piece of software. Oh, why isn't this progressing? There we go. So my origin story, I love astronomy. And here I am, age 15, building my first telescope. It's a six inch Newtonian reflector. 
Uh, and that passion has not gone away. I do astrophotography. Here are some photographs from my own backyard. And as an astrophysicist, love doing research in radio astronomy and have a background in doing protostellar outflows in disks and looking at young cores and young stars and star forming regions. Here I am at the Green Bank Radio Telescope uh, in West Virginia, just after I graduated from college. If you didn't know, it's the largest freestanding radio telescope in the world. And to give you a sense of scale, in that photo, the telescope's about a mile behind me. That thing is almost as large as a football field. It's really impressive. So I had a trajectory majoring in astronomy and physics in college. I was going to be an astrophysicist. And then I had an undergraduate thesis to write. And it turns out, well, I had a lot of data and I needed to visualize the data. And I had no tools to do this kind of thing. And long story short, I ended up learning image registration and segmentation and volume rendering and isosurfaces and discovered this thing called visualization. And I decided not to go astronomy graduate school. I needed to learn more about this and learn these tools and skills and took a couple years to be a research assistant at the Initiative in Innovative Computing at Harvard and focused on computational physics and data visualization, learned everything I could about it, uh, went to grad school to get my PhD in applied physics, but somehow by the end of my dissertation, all my major papers were in data visualization venues and journals and conferences. And I discovered how all those visualization skills I learned to do my astronomy research are very broadly applicable to other domains in medical imaging and chemistry. And then I discovered visualization evaluations and perception and sort of the rest is the history of my career. After graduating from Harvard, I did a postdoc with Tamara Munzner and then joined the faculty at Northeastern University. And now I sit here for you now in this picture. Uh, I like to augment this timeline with what else was going on in my life. There were many parallel facets to this timeline. And in graduate school, I met my husband and we got married and then later had a baby. And now my baby is not such a baby anymore. And I had to add an updated picture to this slide. She hears from her fourth birthday. So this is the other job I have in my life. But let's backtrack a little bit. Let's go back to here, 2006. I finish college. I decide I'm not sure I want to be an astrophysicist. I love this thing called visualization. At Harvard, I was really lucky. And the group I was working with said, hey, and this was specifically Mike Halley and Ron Kikinis at the Surgical Planning Lab. Hey, there's this conference called Viz. We'll pay for you to go. You should just go there and learn about visualization. <gasps> It blew my mind. I've been doing volume rendering and image segmentation and looking at tree diagrams. And when I went to the conference, there were whole sessions on these topics and people doing this type of visualization, not in astronomy, but in all these other fields. And I just couldn't believe it. And that was a huge turning point for me to wanting to become an expert in data visualization. Then in 2007, I went back and presented my first poster at Viz on the application of medical imaging to 3D visualization of astronomy data, where I've been using toolkits like ITK and VTK and 3D Slicer and all these sort of existing algorithms and tools to do more effective, innovative astronomy visualizations to help with insight and discovery. And for those watching and in the audience from the Viz community will appreciate this photo of me presenting to Jim Ahrens. And I'll just give a little plug here about how important the poster sessions are at these conferences and at Viz and what impact they can make. And it was Jim along with other people, including Chris Johnson, Gordon Kindleman, Honolulu Ma, David Laidlaw, my future PhD advisor, Hans Peter Pfister, my future postdoc advisor, Tamara Munzner, who stopped by and it was so influential, validating my work, expressing an interest in the astrophysics work, and sort of making me feel welcome by the community and sort of confident in my decision to say, hey, I should learn a little more about this. 
But let's go back to my 2007 poster from Viz. I'm going to make this a little higher resolution here. And you'll notice a lot of the types of elements of visualizations we've been seeing in the talks today, issues of 2D images, 3D representations, volume rendering versus ISO surfaces, annotations, how do you compare different data, large data, variety of data. Most of this work I was doing and still do is focused on exploration of data with visualization, but there's also a huge component here in communication and not as much my expertise, but we've seen some wonderful examples in the talks today in this workshop, also about communication for the public and education. Now I'm gonna zoom in on one part of this poster and we've been talking a bit, especially uh, Matthew Turk in the talk before me about simulations, which play a pivotal role in astrophysics research. Where in the top here, we have observed data from a real telescope, but on the bottom, it's a simulation or it's a, an simulated observation through radiative transfer of a simulation. And we need to have effective ways to compare these models and theories to the real data. Now, I'm going to change the colors of this isosurface a little bit to make it easier to see. This is the L1448 region of the Perseus molecular cloud, which Alyssa Goodman showed in the keynote earlier, and it's one of my favorite regions. And here's a 3D representation of it. But astronomers, you know, when I work with astrophysicists in my own research and interviewing dozens of others, I've observed and looked at them, they have 2D representations they care about. This is an infrared cloud shine image of the same region. You have hierarchical representations. This is a dendrogram showing the self-gravitating clumps of gas and dust in this cloud to form stars. Uh, here we have metrics to compare the observed L1448 region to a simulation. And what astronomers really need to be able to do is look at all of these things and have an environment where they could brush between them and explore. Now, turns out lots of other domains have this kind of problem. I, in my research in medical imaging, it's the same thing. The cardiovascular researcher wants the 3D representation of the heart, the CT scan, an abstract representation of those arteries that makes it more effective for diagnostics, and then simulated a real data about the flow of blood in that heart. And this sort of uh, canonical framework is across the imaging sciences and parts of science. And it's sort of, it's important in astronomy, but it's also not unique in many ways to astronomy. And now this will be data viz 101 for the viz audience, but an important effect to make this work for analytics is brushing and linking. And Alyssa Goodman mentioned this in her keynote. Here in red, I want to be able to select voxels in that 3D representation and see the equivalent points in the other representations. So I'll label this as linking. But this is easy when you have a table of data. Or for those of us, I love Tableau, who work with Tableau, it's Excel files, it's tabular data. But this is incredibly hard when you have data from different sources, uh, uh, different dimensions, different scales. How do you do this linking? You have to glue the data together. You have to do the data management on the back ends. And a lot of times with these green annotations here, the variables are not the same. Uh, now, it wasn't until I did my postdoc with Tamara Munzner that I was able to sort of take a step back and think about this because I sort of in it a bit as that domain scientist, but take that step back and think about it from the Viz perspective. And we toiled over this to identify what was it that we did, we we're doing, and where to go next. So I'm going to switch back to L1448. It makes it easier for me to think about this with the real numbers here and the real variables. But here are a few of the big challenges dealing with this data. First off, this 3D representation is not three spatial dimensions. One of those dimensions is velocity. And for astronomers out there, it's a PPV cube, position, position, of velocity, very common in radio astronomy. And that's not always an intuitive thing for doing brushing and linking depending on your other spatial dimensions. Speaking of spatial, depending on what telescope you use, what part of the sky you're looking at, is it galactic with LB coordinates or a smaller, closer region with R, and we're using RA deck, having 
effective transformations between these pixels and voxels is important in knowing how to translate between these different uh, scalar transformations. Fabricated data, we talked about simulations here. What happens when you have a simulation in a real thing with completely different spatial coordinates? How do you do that brushing and linking? You have to rely on other dimensions, temperature, density, gravitational pull to help you do that brushing and linking. And that sort of non-spatial linking is critical, but extremely difficult. So this was the picture. Back in 2012, we were looking at, in a group of us at Harvard, namely Alyssa Goodman, Chris Beaumont, Tom Robitaille, and myself started kicking this around, that we really, really wanted this, we needed this, this was hard, how are we gonna do this? And this became like our crusade, our motivation. So here's one of the very first flushed out demos of what became glue, and you have a, a uh, high resolution image here of the W5 star forming region, and we can drag and drop a catalog of young cores and stellar objects. We can now do brushing and linking to look at our color color diagram and look at this essentially information visualizations and brush here, but then get the equivalent points in the other images. And this was our, or at least for me, first big aha moment of, oh my gosh, I think we can do this. So this is glue, and I know the links have been posted in the Discord channel, but here's the link again. And we are, uh, what starts for, a huge, incredible interdisciplinary team. I'm really here representing a massive team of astronomers and computer scientists working together to work with this multidimensional data and make it easier for scientists to find insights in their data. And I would be remiss if I did not mention echoing what Alyssa had that we are an official visualization toolkit for the James Webb Space Telescope and we are heavily funded in part by NASA and the NSF. Now here's another demo video of an astronomer brushing and linking and going through the W5 star forming region. But let me show you some other domains. Here we have some geoscience and we're looking at earthquakes around the globe. It's a 3D visualization on the left and we can do brushing and linking. It's gonna show the points over in 3D. We can also do selection in 3D and get that brushing and linking back into 2D. In terms of domains, also medical imaging is becoming an increasing sort of priority for us in building plugins. And this video is demoing the ability to have multiple 3D renderings in the same space. This is uh, two different volume renderings. Uh, and if UIs are not your thing, that's fine. You can type this all in Python, either in our terminal window as part of the glue, separately and load the scripts in, uh, in other experimental forms. And it's, it was really important to us to have this based on our systems requirements and interviews. It's both so you can have complete control over your data and what you're doing, astronomers like this, but it's also for scriptability, batch processing, and reproducibility. And finally, we've already seen, I could, couldn't have led it better with everyone showing these wonderful demos of open space with GLUE and mentions that we are working at YT with GLUE. Here's Worldwide Telescope inside of GLUE and trying to build this ecosystem of not just gluing data sets together, but gluing tools together. That GLUE is not the be end and all perfect tool. There's other things like why do you do better rendering and Worldwide Telescope's incredible and we can build bridges to these other more specialized tools. And here you can show, see brushing and linking, identify points of interest in a plot in glue, and now it's being uh, represented in Worldwide Telescope. We're gonna make it a little darker blue so you can see it better. You can rotate it around. So starting with astronomy, we really engineered this from the ground up to ultimately be broadly applicable and interdisciplinary. And we're so excited to see that happening as well as continuing to be robust in the visuals in the astronomy community. And I hope that my talk as well as the rest of this workshop will convince you of the richness and variety and incredible data that the astrophysics community has as a rich test bed for the visualization community, but also the visualization community has a lot to learn. The astronomy community has been doing fantastic imaging and visualization work. And I think there's a wonderful bridge and dialogue that can happen between these two communities. Uh, so here's some contact info and the link for glue and I'm happy to take some questions and I'll hang around in Discord even after the Q&A is done. Thank you.
Oh yeah. Thanks again, Michelle, for a wonderful talk. Um, I feel like with your background, you're kind of in this great position to help build this kind of dictionary or vocabulary we've been talking about between the visualization and astronomy communities. Um, and it feels like you've spent a lot of time building uh, this vocabulary as well as the tools connecting the two. Um, are there visualization tools available or in development that astronomers still aren't using or don't know about? Or on the flip side, are there um, astronomy data sets you think would be very fruitful for the visualization community that they just don't know about? Yeah, so I think the answer is yes to both. Um, I can't think of a specific tool. I think a lot of it is general visualization knowledge and literacy. I think astronomers have this great intuitive sense of how to like work with color and things like brushing and linking, but I think there's almost like a formalization. I was so excited to see what uh, Matthew Turk was talking about with formalizing this vocabulary for doing the analysis and volume rendering. And that's kind of like bread and butter for any one of us who were as a type of research, I should say in the information visualization community and makes me so excited to see that. So I think there's methodologies, I think there's theories and there's certainly tools. And I think uh, it goes both ways. I, in terms of data, I think there's a lot of great data out there in astronomy where, you know, we saw um, earlier the Gaia data and there's SDSS, there's these large amounts of data in and people in the VIS community are very interested in the issues of large data both spatial and non-spatial in that intersection of machine learning with visualization. And there's been a lot of great work. I think of some of the citizen science work and the Zooniverse work in astronomy. And I think the Viz community just doesn't know that. And this could be incredible data sets for them to play with and build off of and be challenged. Very cool, thank you, Michelle. Oh, sorry, I thought we had another question, but it was just a comment on how awesome your talk was. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> yeah, so thank you, Michelle. So, um, great. So, yeah, um, so we have won our last talk for this session. Um, so let me know, Technician G, when we are ready to go. To conclude our second session, we have a pair of amazing researchers jointly giving a talk. And one is Angus and one is Joe. One is from computer science visualization, expert on uh, incentive visualization, arts and um, arts installations for visualization and also in graphics. Uh, one Joe is an observational astronomer. So I think this is an excellent example how um, the two communities collaborate and produce something amazing. So here we go. Hi, I'm Angus Forbes, an Associate Professor of Computational Media at UC Santa Cruz. I'm here with Joseph Burchett from the Department of Astronomy at New Mexico State University. Today, we're gonna to talk about a series of interactive visualization projects that investigate intergalactic and circumgalactic media, and which have been used to provide new insight into the structure of the cosmic web. These projects developed out of an ongoing and productive interdisciplinary collaboration between astrophysicists and computer scientists. I want to start this talk today by briefly mentioning the focus of the visualization research at the UCSC Creative Coding Lab and highlight our approach to collaboration. And then I'll hand it off to Joe to discuss the three interactive visualization applications themselves, IGMVIS, Cosmoviz, and Polyform. And by the way, Polyform will also be presented by Oscar, by Oscar Ellick in greater technical detail on Thursday morning during the Planets in Space paper session. At the Creative Coding Lab, part of our research is to develop novel ways to represent and analyze complex data sets and especially dynamic networks. We collaborate with scientists to, de to design visualization tools to make it easier to reason about their data. In the past, we have worked with systems biologists, 
material scientists, and neuroscientists, and now astrophysicists, to create specialized visual analysis tools. I believe there's an enormous and essential opportunity for data scientists and visualization researchers to collaborate with domain scientists on quote unquote, big data projects. This is because many processes don't yet have best practices for how they should be modeled. And many types of data don't yet have best, have best practices for how they should be represented. Interesting data sets are complex and can contain data that is temporal, heterogeneous, ephemeral, multidimensional, probabilistic, etc. Our lab also encourages artistic production, that is art for art's sake, with the expectation that effective design can emerge at the intersection of focused problem solving and creative exploration. You'll see in just a minute an example of one project we described today that was initially inspired through extending and implementation of an agent-based model that is used for generative art, as well as another project that utilizes a real-time volume rendering technique often used for generating clouds, fog, and other atmospheric effects in video games. Even within the lab, there is interdisciplinary expertise in visualization, immersion, computer graphics, human-computer interaction, and machine learning. And I want to highlight the researchers who have contributed to these projects that we're about to show, including Oscar Ellick, David Abramov, Kasha Art Artenagara, sorry, Kasha Artenagara, Jasmine Otto, and Brian Hansen. We have found that data visualization projects are more effective when they are organized around tasks. The more specific and detailed, the better. Perhaps somewhat counterintuitively, by working at first with only one or just a few data sets, it focuses the visualization design and it ends up being more generally useful for a wider range of data sets. We can often become enamored with the concept of exploratory data analysis, that simply putting the data on the screen in some interesting way will automatically lead to new insights. And while this certainly can be true, in my experience, creating a visualization around an organizing principle of enabling specific analysis tasks produces better tools. On the other hand, I've also found that during development, tasks can evolve or even be completely redefined. While user-centered design often includes an ideation phase prior to the building of an artifact or tool, I think that the act of creating, not just using a data visualization, is in and of itself a good way to understand a data set, as well as a good way to refine the initial analysis tasks. And moreover, this process can sometimes help us to figure out which analysis tasks are in fact the most scientifically meaningful. It's also good to remember that one single tool doesn't need to support every task. In visualization design, we often talk about reducing visual clutter, but it can also be helpful to think about functionality clutter, and it's perfectly reasonable to work on multiple related visualization projects simultaneously. While neither I nor anyone else in the Creative Coding Lab will ever become an astrophysicist, over the last year or so, Members of the lab spent a lot of time learning about astrophysics from Joe and from some of his collaborators. And I believe that the willingness to absorb new knowledge can only be a benefit to visualization. Similarly, Joe, while not a computer scientist or designer by trade, certainly has both programming experience as well as many, many ideas about how his data should be represented. And I think that this cross-disciplinary curiosity is a motivating factor for creating effective visualization tools. Universal design principles based around, for example, our knowledge of human perception, to me, ends up being less important in practice than getting a good understanding of the scientific questions that motivate the need for the inter interactive visualization tool in the first place. So those are some of my high-level reflections on the collaborative process of creating scientific data visualization tools. Now let me hand it over to Joe to discuss our tools for visualizing extragalactic ecosystems. Yeah, thanks, Angus. I wanted to set the stage scientifically for some of the projects our team has been working on over the past couple of years. Seen here is a simulation of the formation and evolution of the entire universe. Here one sees the so-called cosmic web, the large-scale filamentary structure of the universe within which galaxies form and evolve. The cosmic web consists of filaments, uh, voids which are relatively empty, and nodes where filaments intersect and where massive galaxy clusters form. Importantly, Galaxies clearly do not form in isolation, but rather within ecosystems. And ultimately, we aim to understand this interplay between galaxies and their large-scale environments. 
This is one of the key data sets we've brought to bear on these scientific questions. This is simply a map of galaxies observed with the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, and already from the locations of galaxies on the sky, we can make out the form of the cosmic web, filaments, voids, and nodes, where the coma cluster and its cousins have formed, marked here in purple squares. Part of what's so great about this data set, however, is that all of the structure is probed by background quasars that have been observed with the Hubble Space Telescope. This allows us to study the gas around and between galaxies, the circumgalactic and intergalactic medium, which will bear the imprint of these galaxy-environment interactions. How does this work? When we observe a quasar in the distant universe, as the light passes from the quasar through the cosmic web on its way to us, uh, depicted in the top panel here, the line of sight passes through uh, the circumgalactic medium and intergalactic medium within the cosmic web, and this gas leaves an absorption line imprint on the spectrum of the background quasar, shown in the bottom panel. The presence or absence and various attributes we can measure about these absorption lines tell us about the physical conditions that are within the CGM and the IGM. It became clear that this large multidimensional data set warranted new innovative analysis tools. IGM Viz was our first collaborative effort where we combined the galaxy maps from SDSS with the quasar spectra from Hubble in one web-based interactive interface. Shown along the right of the screen are three brilliant students from Angus's lab, without whom this would not have been possible. Now for a brief demonstration of IGM Viz. Laid out in three dimensions are the galaxies from the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. Uh, blue points represent star-forming galaxies. Red points represent quenched galaxies, or those no longer forming stars. And you can see already evident the cosmic web structure within this 3D arrangement of galaxies. As I mentioned before, one of the great assets of this data set are the quasar spectra that probe the foreground environment. So these are visualized with these skewers here, you see shaded by the level of absorption uh, that is registered from neutral hydrogen. We can take measurements on the fly uh, within this tool, uh, looking at different profiles of gas within the circumgalactic medium. Uh, this is one sample of galaxies I chose that were be a, to be in relatively isolated environments. And this is from uh, a denser sample of galaxies around the coma cluster. Already from this exploratory analysis, we can see the impacts of the large scale environment on the circumgalactic medium noted by all of the upper limits, non-detections of neutral hydrogen uh, found in the quasar spectra. However, we wanted to characterize the cosmic web environment a bit more rigorously by quantifying the filamentary structure. We aren't the first to try this, as I show two approaches here, a geometric construction approach on the left, and a density kernel-based approach on the right. However, neither of these was entirely suitable for our analysis, so we sought the help of a rather unconventional friend. Meet the slime mold. For much of the year, they live as single cells, but in autumn, they come together. A relentless, shape-shifting yellow goo that scours the forest for bacterial food. The Physerum polycephalum is a remarkable protist unicellular organism that has an uncanny knack for finding super efficient pathways between food sources. In the lab, the slime mold has been used to, for example, solve the travel and salesman problem, as well as reproduce the uh, Tokyo railway system, as you see here in the bottom right. Inspired by the artwork of Sage Jensen, who had adapted an algorithm designed to mimic the slime mold for his artwork, uh, shown here on the left, we adapted and extended this algorithm to operate in 3D and fit the cosmic web. Oscar Ellick, who has done most of the uh, development and adaptation of this algorithm, uh, has a paper here at Viz, uh, is giving that on Thursday, so uh, be sure and check that out um, and talk to him about more details uh, regarding this algorithm and its implementation. So let's see the Monte Carlo Fizzerum machine algorithm in action. The 3D galaxy distribution shown in red, serve as food sources for the Fizzerum agents, shown in white, that are swarming through the volume. The agents settle into paths that trace the underlying large-scale structure.
Parameters of the model can be manipulated on the fly, such as the agent's search distance changing here. Visualizing the main components of the model, the galaxy data and agents, as we saw in the previous video, the deposit or signal emitted by galaxies, and trace, the aggregated pathways of the agents. The trace serves as a proxy for the cosmic density field. Here, the highest density cores of filaments are shown in red, lower density regions in green, and voids in blue. As the quasar spectra pierce this volume, we can assign a local density to each pixel, coupling it to the hydrogen absorption signature in that pixel. Repeating this analysis for all of our quasar spectra, we aggregate the absorption signature as a function of local cosmic web density. Indeed, we find three density regimes reflected in the intergalactic medium. Voids, where little to no absorption is present. The interfilamentary gas, where the absorption monotonically increases with density. And the highest density regime, where the gas is likely shock heated and over ionized, reversing the increasing trend seen in the previous regime. We dub this onset of absorption the edge of the intergalactic medium. We have since employed MCPM to characterize the large scale structure along the line of sight to a fast radio burst and are continuing to use this framework towards better understanding the galaxy environment connection. Lastly, we'd like to introduce CosmoViz, a visualization and analysis tool for cosmological simulations that we believe will revolutionize how astronomers and the general public alike will think about the cosmic web. Volumetrically rendered are the dark matter in purple and intergalactic gas color-coded by temperature. The stars within galaxies are rendered as particles. CosmoViz will host several simulation data sets, seen here as the Eagle 25 megaparsec box, and allow users to freely explore these simulated universes in three dimensions and produce synthetic observations just like we might obtain with Hubble. Several tools within the visualization interface allow the user to focus in on certain regions of the universe that may contain interesting features for example, in the gas distribution as seen here in the circumgalactic medium. This is the largest data set we've incorporated thus far, Illustrious TNG 100, which we prepared for the data challenge for this workshop. Please see our data challenge entry for a lot more from this data set. Please stay tuned, as CosmoViz will be publicly released early next year with the initial batch of simulations with many more to follow. It's been a great pleasure to share our work with you today and hear about all of the great things happening in the astrophysics visualization arena. We thank the organizers for inviting us and will gladly take any questions you may have. Thank you. Uh, thank you again, Joe and Angus, for that awesome talk. Uh, we have a question from Juna. Um, she wants to know, how do I launch a project into the Creative Coding Lab? Um, Zooniverse, for example, was a citizen science platform born from SDSS and inspired, uh, she believes, by SETI at Home. Is there a Vizverse? Uh, I'm not sure if there's a Vizverse that covers um, every possible visualization that's out there, but there are certainly surveys that uh, various folks in the visualization community put up for different sub areas of uh, data visualization and scientific visualization. Um, and I believe uh, Bay Wang, one of the organizers of this uh, workshop is preparing a survey for, for in the future. Um, to get involved with the Creative Coding Lab, you are welcome to reach out to me. We're always looking for interesting data sets. And as you've just seen, we're especially excited about astrophysics uh, data, which we find um, challenging and pushes our boundaries of, in, in terms of how to represent data at such large scale and how to um, encapsulate relevant tasks that actually help uh, specific uh, uh, astrophysicists. Um, I guess speaking to that, another question is any thoughts on applying CosmoViz to network visualization? 
Um, I think that's a great idea. As I mentioned um, in the beginning of this talk, I tend to work best when I have a, a very, or my lab tends to work best when I have a very clear focus. But um, it does seem to happen that once you develop a technique for a specific data set, that then you can start thinking about how to apply it to other data sets. So we're um, very interested in looking at other data sets, especially network data sets. And in fact, Oscar Ellick and my student Henry Zhao presented a paper at Viz for Digital Humanities yesterday using the polyform algorithm, which again was developed precisely to look at these astrophysics data sets, um, especially simulation data sets, and applied it to looking at language embeddings, looking at an NLP task using this reconstruction model. So that's kind of a fortuitous um, event that uh, arose after conversations with a uh, linguistics professor here at UC Santa Cruz. So we do think there's other opportunities to use these techniques for uh, other data sets. Yeah, and I would say, just say that the Monte Carlo Fizzer and Machine algorithm uh, is, in, is in some ways a, um, you know, an alternative to some of the uh, traditional uh, uh, algorithms and so forth developed to do network analysis um, on data sets. And so, um, so I think, yeah, just bringing all of that full circle with our tools, Polyform, um, and perhaps um, you know, however we could uh, work you know, the results of such network analysis into a tool like CosmoViz, uh, one, um, one particular problem we're trying to solve now is, is um, filament identification uh, within the cosmic web. And so um, I think drawing on a lot of, um, of, of network analysis concepts and such, we'll, we'll be employing um, and doing that. And, and, and I think all of that is, is definitely ripe for just, you know, directly um, transferring over to these uh, other, uh, visualization interfaces. Awesome. Thank you, uh, Joe and Ingus, uh, for a great talk. Thank yes. you. All right, so for the last uh, 30 minutes of our workshop, um, we'd like to have a discussion around the data challenge um, that we posed for the workshop. Um, and so the inspiration for this uh, data challenge was to both encourage more collaboration between the visualization and astronomy communities um, and to kind of help build this vocabulary where more vis folks would understand the astronomy side and more astronomy folks would understand the visualization side. Um, and so the, the challenge that we posed was to visualize the large scale structure of the universe um, and um, correlate it or associate it with the galaxies that are kind of embedded within it. And so we'll have um, Dylan, Nes Dylan Nelson, who's part of the illustrious team, uh, describe the data and what the challenge is. And then we'll have um, Joe and Angus who kind of submitted um, the winner to the challenge, uh, discuss uh, what their solution is. Um, and then we're hoping we can facilitate some discussion about how we can encourage more of these collaborations um, between um, astronomers and the Viz community. Um, so again, if you have any questions, please post them um, to the Discord. Um, but before I turn it over to Dylan, we did want to um, give the certificate to uh, Joe and Angus and their team. Um, and so here is our uh, Viz 2020 certificate. Um, I think your guys' submission really went above and beyond uh, what we were expecting. So you guys were the clear, uh, clear winners. Um, and I'm very excited to um, share what you guys have done with the community. Um, but so just hopefully, I'm hoping this works, a round of applause for you guys. Can y'all hear you. that? Great. Yes. Um, I just think, it, yeah, it's really cool what you guys have done. Um, 
and we will send this certificate to you. And I think there might be a monetary prize associated with it, but we are still waiting on clearance for how much we're allowed to actually give you guys for uh, the great job you guys did. Oh, it's starting again. Um, okay, so Dylan, uh, do you mind taking it away and just give us an overview kind of of the data and the uh, challenge that you posed? Absolutely, yeah. Can you guys hear me okay? Yes. Then I will share my screen, find some slides and get rid of that. You can see that, okay? Yep, looks good. Great, yeah, thanks. So I'm Dylan Nelson and Lauren asked me just to talk for three or four minutes and uh, tell you what, uh, tell you something about cosmological simulations, their data and uh, visualization opportunities. And they are super cool is the short answer. So the one way we like to phrase this is that a cosmological simulation is a universe in a box. And our goal here is really to create a synthetic virtual universe, which is so realistic that you cannot tell it apart from the true universe. So I'm not going to go into any science here, but I want to tell you our motivation, right? So we're, we're working within this lambda cold dark matter paradigm of how structure forms. And we want to develop a model for galaxy formation and how galaxies evolve over time. We want to do that from, uh, for all galaxies, which are actually observed in the true universe, from these very small dwarf galaxies all the way up to galaxy superclusters, the most massive uh, bound objects in the universe. And we want to do this across all of cosmic time from essentially the beginning of the universe down to the present day. And, and a really powerful tool to do that is what I'm calling here these cosmological hydrodynamical simulations. And cosmological, I mean that the initial conditions of these simulations are based on Lambda CDM, and that these are very large uh, statistically representative volumes. And hydrodynamical means these are not just gravity only or dark matter only simulations, they also simulate gas stars and black holes and all of the uh, messy physics which goes along with that. So keep in mind that galaxy formation as a, as a problem is, is pretty difficult and it's very multi-scale, which means it has a very large uh, range, dynamic range of spatial scale. So from uh, gigaparsec scales here where the universe is homogeneous down to megaparsec scales of individual dark matter halos, down to kiloparsec scales of a galaxy and down to sub parsec scales for the physics going on within that galaxy, we have this enormous uh, opportunity to simulate and to visualize what's going on uh, in this rather complicated problem. And so uh, a recent example of a cosmological simulation, the kind of current state of the art is the illustrious TNG project. And what I'm showing you here, this image is kind of the family uh, portrait, the family picture of the project. It's made up of these three simulations, which we, we lovingly call TNG-50, TNG-100, and TNG-300, which just tell you how big of a simulation they are. And, and keep in mind, so this, these are large uh, computational projects. As a whole, this effort took about 200 million uh, CPU core hours. And if, that, if you're not familiar with this uh, unit, just take my word for it, these are very expensive uh, numerical calculations. So, in TNG, in these simulations, we can create a visuals, right? We can visualize what comes out. And what I'm showing you here are actually virtual galaxies, which formed inside this TNG 50 simulation, where what we've done is we've taken the light, which we think is coming out of the stars, and we've actually uh, processed that light through the dust, which attenuates that light and creates these very cool dust lanes, uh, which blocks out the light when galaxies become more and more edge on, as is also seen in observational data. Uh, if we zoom out by a factor of a thousand, we see a completely different kind of visualization. So this is a merger of a galaxy cluster. We have these two cores of galaxies here shown in orange and in between them is a, is a bridge of dark matter shown in blue as these two uh, cores crash together and form a galaxy cluster. Uh, again, zooming out, this, this fireball actually shows you the motion of gas. So black here is gas, which is at rest and white is gas moving at thousands of kilometers a second. And again, this is the formation of an enormous object here at the coalescence of these three uh, filaments of the cosmic web. Zooming out again, we really start to see that cosmic web. So here are the filaments of large scale structure highlighted by dark matter halos. You see them in orange, where the blue in contrast actually shows you the locations of cosmic shocks, which have formed on the boundaries between voids and filaments. So very cool. 
And of course, we don't just make pictures to make pretty pictures. We also make pictures to study science and understand what these simulations tell us. This is just an example. This is an evolution in time of an outflow driven by a supermassive black hole, something we really are understanding in these simulations. So the data ultimately and where these simulation comes from is just a bunch of numbers, of course. I wanted to just show it to you. So for us, the data is HDF5 files, lots of HDF5 files. And uh, ultimately, the, what I'm showing you here is a snapshot, one snapshot of data in the simulation. And it's grouped into these five different types of particles. You have our gas, dark matter, what we call tracers, stars, and black holes. Now, for all 15.6 billion dark matter particles here, we know where they are in space, right? We know their coordinates and we know their velocities, but not much else about them that's actually interesting. But, but for the gas and for the stars and the black holes, we know an enormous amount of information about uh, what those um, components of the simulation are doing. So lots of opportunities to visualize. And so this is the uh, complete representation of the simulation, so to speak, the snapshot. And on top of that, we also know about the objects which exist in that snapshot. So the dark matter halos and the galaxies themselves. And you see again, for every galaxy and every dark matter halo, we know a whole lot of labels, a whole lot of quantities about each object. Okay, so you have your universe in a box. It it's, is literally a box, a periodic cube. You have these typical types of particles represented, gas, dark matter, stars, and black holes. In the simulation we're, like this, we're typically saving something like 100 snapshots in time. And these are large, a few terabytes. And we often also save something we call uh, sub-volumes or sub-boxes, thousands of them at high time resolution. And this is what allows us to make movies in time, in essence. And again, keep in mind, the data we're actually saving, it's really a scattered uh, point set in some sense. So X, Y, Z in space, and then many, 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 many labels attached to each one of those positions in space. What I'm showing you here is actually the list of simulations that you can go and download. And just to emphasize, at least for me, we're really here pushing to the regime of uh, big data. So a petabyte of data. Uh, now past where you can download online and 20 uh, trillion uh, particles. So you can imagine that pulling some sort of scientific insight out of that amount of data can be quite challenging. That's why visualization is critical for these types of projects. And with so much data, there's an extraordinary uh, richness which comes out of the simulations, which I want to just highlight. So I'm showing you here, this is just a slice through one of the simulations where the dark matter is. So it shows you the dark matter structure. We also, of course, know about the gas structure. We know about the gas motion. We know about the stars, where they are. We know about the temperature of the gas. We know about the enrichment of the gas by heavy elements, the shocks of the cosmic web, the magnetic fields in the gas, and the predicted X-ray emission from the simulation, all which is just to say these simulations are so rich in their output that there's an enormous number of opportunities, both for science and for visualization. And so we posed a bit of a challenge, uh, which was to uh, visualize and understand better the relationship between galaxies and the cosmic web which, within which they are embedded. So back to this picture, you know, we have millions of galaxies, which are ultimately little small dots everywhere within this cosmic web. And we wanted to ask questions like, now, do galaxies know about their location in the cosmic web? Do properties of a galaxy depend somehow on the distance, say, from that galaxy to its nearest sheet or void or node or filament? And for instance, if a, if a galaxy looks like a disk and it's thin and rotating, is it spinning in a direction which is aligned with a nearby filament? Um, and yes, so this data is all public. I really encourage you to check it out if you're interested. And it's always great to see what people come up with and what visuals they come up with from such large and rich data sets. So I'll stop there. Thanks. Awesome. Thank you, Dylan. Um, and now, uh, Joe and Angus, would you guys like to present your solution to that problem? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So I'll just say that um, this is an absolute honor to um, to be recognized here among uh, these uh, very esteemed folks, experts, um, giants on whose shoulders we uh, are really standing, like literally, 
because um, as we'll see uh, later on, um, YT is absolutely critical to, um, to our entry. Um, but without further ado, yeah, so, uh, so this really was a challenge um, in the truest sense of the word. So uh, Dylan mentioned two data sets. One was the dark matter halos uh, from Alestra's TNG, uh, and the other is the gas particles. Uh, and if you notice some of the numbers, uh, some of the data sizes uh, he had um, next to, um, next to uh, those uh, different data sets, the uh, dark matter halos was something to the tune of um, a couple of gigabytes the gas particles, uh, a couple of terabytes uh, per snapshot. So uh, what we wanted to do was, was to um, quantitatively um, uh, quantify the, uh, the density of the cosmic web, uh, similarly to how um, I was just describing in the talk, uh, in the last talk. And so first we took the, the dark matter halos um, and incorporated those uh, into polyform, uh, which you see here in the, um, the, the lighter colored uh, um, uh, spheres. And uh, our Monte Carlo Fizzera machine uh, fit to the cosmic web to infer the filamentary structure in the, uh, in the dens density field um, is shown uh, here in this uh, blue-green um, uh, color scheme. So, uh, so in this way, we were able to infer the uh, local cosmic density of, um, of each point in the TNG uh, 100 megaparsec by 100 megaparsec by 100 megaparsec uh, volume. Um, and so this is just visualizing the density uh, in, in slightly different way. Uh, the uh, void regions are in blue. Um, the outskirts of filaments um, are shown in green and the cores of filaments and nodes of the cosmic web are shown in red. Um, so we uh, have been, one of the major problems as I was saying earlier that we've been working on is trying to extract uh, individual filaments to identify uh, where these uh, where these are and and um, and so here this is our, our one of our attempts uh, at visualizing um, sort of our method for doing this. So uh, this is taking um, all of the aggregated uh, velocities of uh, of the slime mold agents within our uh, MCPM simulation, and we're visualizing the direction that these uh, these agents are are, are traveling. Um, as they are finding the cosmic web structure. So you can clearly see that, um, you know, for, for example, on, on this face, uh, filaments that are sort of left to the right uh, are, are redder in color. Um, those that are up and down here are, are sort of greenish in color. And so this uh, will enable us to um, directly infer uh, the, the underlying structure to identify specific filaments of the cosmic web by um, the motions of these uh, simulated uh, slime mold agents, uh, which we think is pretty cool. And now uh, onto the uh, association with the galaxies. Uh, so uh, the galaxies, in addition to just their locations and, and masses, we also know the star formation activity of, uh, of these galaxies. And so this is just showing the, the red galaxies are those that have uh, quenched their star formation. Um, they, they're no longer forming stars. And those that are blue are actively star forming. And just as we expect, um, residing here uh, in the nodes of the cosmic web are the, um, the quenched galaxies or, or red galaxies. So um, just to take this uh, one step further, I would like to um, change to a different view. Gotta love. Okay, and so as I said, the, the uh, MCPM uh, provides uh, a cosmic density, a local cosmic density field uh, for every point uh, in the TNG volume. So we can go back and we can ask ourselves, um, each galaxy that is um, from the TNG catalog, at what density uh, does that galaxy reside? And so that's plotted along the vertical axis here. Uh, galaxies in denser environments are going to be plotted uh, towards the top. This is just a 2D histogram as a function of that galaxy's mass and its local environmental density. Uh, how many galaxies in that mass and environment bin are quenched? Uh, and so at fixed stellar mass, we see an increase in the uh, fraction of quenched galaxies in that bin. Um, but then there's a really interesting uh, phenomenon here 
as we go to denser, uh, sorry, to, to higher masses, um, those galaxies are actually able to remain star forming uh, in denser and denser environments, suggesting that those galaxies that um, uh, have uh, more mass and are able to um, sort of hold on to that gas supply as they enter dense environments uh, are able to sustain their star formation for longer. And then uh, the other facet of our, um, of our entry was actually to render the gas particles uh, and uh, from TNG within CosmoViz. And so this is uh, CosmoViz here. This is the TNG uh, 100 uh, gas particle data uh, laid out in CosmoViz. I'm, I'm uh, controlling it in real time here. And so this is, um, yeah, so 1.7 terabytes, I think was the download on this. Uh, David Abramoff, who um, has really been the lead developer for CosmoViz, uh, he actually was, was downloading these data. It took him about a week. And, um, and part of the process is we, we bring those data into YT and we extract voxelized grids from YT, which we then uh, visualize through our um, sort of custom rendering scheme uh, for both the volumetric rendering of gas and dark matter and particle rendering of, of the stars. At any rate, um, he frantically messages me and is like, I don't think I have enough hard drive slash computing space slash memory on this machine uh, to do this. Um, can you download the data? I started downloading the data. We had about um, a week left on the data challenge, I think at this point. And uh, it was going to take me a week to download the data. So I took him this uh, extra hard uh, drive out of this computer, uh, met him on a street corner near his place. He grabs it, puts it into his computer, copies the data over, we exchange it back and we, anyway, we're able to get the data all processed and loaded into CosmoViz. And the result is just, I think rather breathtaking. We're, enable, you know, we're, we're able to uh, interact with the data, um, these volumetric you know, gas data essentially very much in, in real time, this is, this is the full um, volume, um, the illustrious TNG data set. And I was just trying to find the region, uh, the, the beautiful merger of three filaments um, that, that Dylan was showing in his, uh, in his slides. Um, not sure I found it, but I did find this pretty cool little, little wall structure over here that's just full of, of gas. So the hot gas is in red cool gases in blue, uh, intermediate temperatures are shown in the uh, sort of orangish uh, colors here. So yeah, this has been a lot of fun. Uh, under active development, CosmoViz is, um, is funded through uh, an archival uh, data research and theory uh, research grant from the Hubble Space Telescope. Uh, and one of the main aims from this is to be able to um, extract uh, synthetic spectra just like those quasar spectra uh, I was analyzing uh, in the previous talk uh, in real time in this visualization, uh, this 3D visualized environment. And so, you know, with that, one can, can draw a skewer, um, request the spectrum, and the spectrum will be generated in a few minutes uh, because this data set is so large. But, um, you can see the skewer there sort of probing the halo of this galaxy. And then one can just directly um, can just directly do the kinds of experiments we wish we could do with the real universe if we had an infinite number of quasars lining up just in the right, just in the right configurations behind the galaxies we'd like to study. So yeah, with that, I'd like to take any questions about the data challenge, but really uh, Looking forward to some conversation uh, with the rest of the folks who've presented here today. Uh, thank you, Joe. Yeah, in the chat, everyone's blowing up about how awesome this submission is. So um, congrats again. Uh, this is great work. <laughs> Thanks so much. Um, yeah, that rendering is just incredible. Um, and I was really glad you showed that plot of the quenching um, fraction as a function of density versus stellar mass. Because I felt like that was a really good example of a visualization tool, you know, answering scientific questions, um, which is awesome to see. Um, but to start this discussion kind of about building um, 
connections between our two communities. Um, Joe and Angus, can you guys say something about um, the challenges of, um, or how such a fruitful collaboration that you guys have kind of came to be and the challenges of working with um, astronomy data sets? Um, the challenges from a visualization point of view are the need to really absorb a lot of knowledge in an area that we're not experts in. Um, <clears throat> and likewise, I think the challenge for astrophysicists or domain scientists is to understand the, you know, to, to gain a visual literacy. And I think that in a lot of collaborations, it's very fruitful that, you know, one person is the visualization expert, the other person is the domain scientist. But in this case, I think what made it so fruitful is that folks in my lab were really interested in learning about astrophysics and folk, and Joe himself was very interested in learning about visualization and already had some familiarity with it. So um, I think that was super helpful. And additionally, one thing that helped us, seeing as we don't have a full-time team of developers, we haven't written a super large grant that will fund uh, students to be, you know, to, to be dedicated to this one project, rather than trying to make one big project that does everything, we've been creating uh, smaller uh, software packages. I'm just seeing some of the comments here from the, the folks at Glue. It would be great at some point to integrate this, these tools to larger packages to make them more widely available, but definitely getting started, it was much more helpful to work on smaller projects with very focused tasks and indeed specific data sets at first. Um, and Joe had very specific scientific questions and basically had this great idea of kind of merging um, observational approaches with uh, a, uh, with, with anal using that as a metaphor to analyze scientific data sets and including the simulated data sets. So it was kind of a natural process with lots and lots and lots of iteration for each individual project and then from project to project. We also have a sonif data sonification project we're working on, which we didn't talk about today, but we, so that's at least four separate projects we're working on. Um, and uh, it's an open question for, will they fold into each other or, or will projects, how can we get them out to the water community? But in terms of getting it started, it was helpful to kind of um, keep keep it very focused on specific scientific tasks. Yeah, and I would yeah, just say that, Cosmoviz, yeah, in particular, the, the challenges there um, is we're trying to, um, you know, this synthetic spectrum generation um, is, uh, is in itself a, a, a pretty computationally intensive um, uh, operation that uses big data set with um, like, you know, this, uh, gas particle data, for example, here uh, uh, in TNG. Um, and so th these are just enormous data sets. And so, uh, so you know, we were leveraging um, for that particular task, uh, Trident, um, this, uh, this brilliant synthetic spectrum generation software uh, written by uh, Cameron Hummels, Britton Smith and, and team. Um, and, uh, you know, I mentioned during the, um, I mentioned during the, uh, the little uh, uh, show and tell there, you know, that YT was absolutely critical to reading in these data um, and, and producing the voxelized grid. So I think as we've scaled up in complexity, uh, you know, we've really just had to leverage um, these, these tools. Like I said, I mean, we're, we're really kind of standing on the shoulders of giants in terms of what has been done within the community within the past several years to, um, to ingest these data sets and, and make meaningful products out of them. Um, and sorry, in our last couple of minutes, the crowd wants to know, uh, Dylan, how do you feel about the results? No, no, I think they're super cool. Yeah, I'm obviously very impressed. I mean, uh, uh, what is there to say? It's very hard data to work with. And uh, I think the approach that you guys took uh, massaging it and doing the uniform grid rendering, especially I really think that the um, it's a it's a web application, right? I understood that correctly. So it's running; it can run in the browser, uh, which I think is one of the best ways to connect to people, right? It's really hard to have a big application someone has to download, but when you get it running in the browser, suddenly very fast you can have you know it hits Reddit. You could have a hundred thousand people trying to use it at once, which is when it, things get really fun. So. Um, yeah, I think that's a great, it's a really impressive look and also the accessibility is very cool. Awesome. So in our, our last minute uh, to 
people from the panel have something they'd like to say or the organizers, do you have any concluding, concluding thoughts? Well, so I think one thing, uh, you know, big purpose of getting, uh, you know, getting this workshop going um, was to really bring forward uh, a, a broader group of visualization folks and a broader group of astronomers to have this conversation. I think there have been these synergies and we have this these wonderful examples that we have um, uh, talked about today, but I think growing the community is gonna be increasingly important. And so I guess um, one question that, that I would just pose for, for discussion is, uh, we talked a little bit about the barrier to communication. Um, is there some type of uh, kind of like regular check-in place or point anywhere in kind of space and time uh, where people can kind of get together and chat about this or is it just in these informal um, or for more formal kind of collaborations that people are, are uh, doing? I think that's something that, I, that is, uh, we'd be eager to kind of continue this conversation because there were many different data challenges that one could have here. And I think having uh, more, more frequent uh, contact would be, would be great. I mentioned before when we were in our private session that that we were all bathing in COVID at the end of uh, February in New York. And, and that was Jackie's idea. Why don't we have our Glucon, our hackathon that we have a couple times a year um, in New York uh, and, and to ask David Spurgle to host it at the CCA, um, which he did. And so we got a lot of interaction between CCA people, American Museum of Natural History people, and the community of developers who would want to get together anyway, who came from far and wide. So, so one, one suggestion I would have would be to have these kind of hackathon that people have anyway um, at a place where you can then interact with a bunch of astronomers um, or maybe a bunch of visualization people. But to like when we're allowed to travel again, remember that? Go somewhere and do that. <laughs> Well, I did see Chris Johnson in the Discord, uh, and so maybe uh, is Ski a place where we could be uh, potentially having regular uh, <laughs> uh, sci hacks? Absolutely, once we can resume travel, I think it's a good place to be most of the season, right? whether you are a skier or a hiker, but it's a good uh, environment where we can potentially try to host some of those events. Well, maybe people could could uh, you know say in the chat if they would be interested in virtual events. We also had a virtual uh, workshop um, uh, about sort of visualization previously uh, earlier this year, and I was surprised at how interesting they are and how um, how effective I think in terms of getting collaborations going they can be. And so, if people are interested in kind of more virtual follow ups, I think we can make that happen before we get everyone vaccinated. I have a whole list of people to email from just this, so I guess I have to agree with you. <laughs> I wanted to just offer too that when when it is possible that we could all be together, I I love love the idea that we can gather in a space like a planetarium. So like the Hayden Planetarium, for instance, which is where we did do um, uh, in tandem with CCA, the Center for Computational Astrophysics. We were at the Hayden Planetarium. And that was because the scientists can be there from the research side proposing what they want to do and then visualizers or the hybrid model are there helping to make it happen. And then in the evening you get like dessert, which is seeing it in the dome. And it's so cool. So yeah, we, we, well, Jackie's not bragging enough. We had a public event. Um, this is all her idea uh, that night uh, after we had played with the Radcliffe wave all day long. And uh, yeah, it was great. Absolutely great. Yes, you can invite your friends and family too. So then it's really the education side pops out as well. You can impress people by the visuals and it's so cool. So one thing actually this raises, which I think is something that I've been thinking a lot about too. Um, you know, Alyssa showed this, um, visual, this, uh, this cube that allows you to take, uh, you know, kind of carry around in your pocket. It's 20 bucks and you can get your data on there. Um, and, uh, <laughs> and, and that's, that's pretty phenomenal. Then not everyone has a planetarium like Jackie, <laughs> um, but in terms of intermediate hardware, um, kind of making, you know, we just finished, uh, uh, installing our visualization space, our visualization lab so that, you know, at a, at an intermediate scale, people can be collaborating in exactly the way that you described, but maybe they, they can't build a planetarium in their 
um, you know, in their, in their, in their building. Do people feel like there are kind of hardware um, uh, kind of needs here that should be, um, you know, Alyssa talked about this a little bit in her talk and I would actually like her to unpack that a bit sure. more. And then, and then there's another question from Discord. So we're not gonna, uh, we'll get to that in a sure. second. Sure, so this thing, I mean, basically I took, I took the, uh, the pandemic as an opportunity to uh, you know, do things I had been wanting to do for a long time. So I bought a bunch of different 3D interaction devices. Somebody put, I'm sorry, I can't remember who, but somebody in the audience put that they have been working on 3D selection. So Michelle mentioned uh, our computer science colleague at Harvard, Hans-Peter Pfister, who does a lot of visualization. And it took me like three years to explain to him what I meant by 3D selection being an unsolved problem. So let's say you looked at those filaments that uh, Joe and Angus were just showing, right? Yeah, you could use some thresholding technique and try to find a constant density surface, but you would not pick the same thing that an astrophysicist would pick. You actually want them to be able to sculpt some 3D selection out of that. And yeah, you want it informed by some sort of smart, maybe machine learning based algorithm first, but then you want them to be able to like adjust things with their hands probably. So I've been on this quest to try to do that um, for like a decade. And uh, so I have a lot of connects and a hollow lens and friends in high places and this thing, okay, you know, I bought a game controller and we won't talk about all the non $20 things that I own. But anyway, so um, this thing is now clearly the way to, you know, for like, imagine that cube that you were just seeing, because I'm going to say it has a problem, okay, not the cube, the device. So in other words, imagine that cube with all the filaments in here and you could like turn it around and stuff. And I showed that like we have just a little slider where you can zoom in and out. But imagine what you really want is like two-way control from glue. So you can do stuff that's much easier to do on a screen and then see the result instantly here. But you also want somehow some kind of interface to, to touch things and to, to use your hands. And so what I understand from the stuff I read about the AR kit development, so we already, like I said, you don't even need this. You can just project it on the, on the table. But trying to figure out like how to use the camera that's in my computer just that one, nothing fancy, you know, and not a, the leap motion hasn't been good enough yet, but that's the thing that supposedly can track your fingers. But when you can track your hands and start to like interact and extrude stuff and move stuff around and do this 3D selection, I think the hardware we need to involve is this. And I don't, you know, it's almost getting there in the commercial world, but not quite. And so thank you pandemic for letting me discover the merge cube. Um, but I don't know what's next. And I, I'm hoping other people have opinions about that. I think like if I could, uh, like what you were saying about the planetarium, it's like, it's true that not everyone can be Jackie and having a planetarium in the backyard, <laughs> but there's like maybe like 3000 planetariums around the world and they're all very close to universities usually, but I don't think by coincidence. So I think there's, a, a, particularly for visualization researchers, there's probably a planetarium within an hour driving distance from any university. So, and those people there starved for content and having having a researcher coming in with completely new data sets and everything, it's I think there's there's a gold mine of potential uh, outreach. I have to say, there. Alex, I agree with you and I disagree with you. So I agree with you that for the people in this little Zoom thing, you're totally right. For your run of the mill average astronomer, no way. And so Kai Lee at Princeton a long time ago, who, who was building these huge display walls, he told me this story that has never left my mind about how they built these giant displays uh, in the cafeteria at Princeton and they thought the scientists would come use them and they would not go anywhere. And he said, you have to bring it to them in some way that's not outside what they normally do. And so some of you know who Charlie Latta and Tom Damar, and so they're two excellent astronomers who don't know anything about visualization. And when we showed them this thing and we showed them real data on it, which by the way, the data I showed before are secret. So like, I don't know what to do with this video, but anyway, never mind. Uh, so when I showed them this, both of them who are both in their 60s and 70s, not that age is correlated with technical skill, but anyway, um, uh, they both said, where do I get that? And Juna said, where do I get that? And so in other words, I think this kind of thing, which is like a cute little, it bounces, I can't show you, but you know, $20, I have no, no commercial interest in that. I'm just telling you, uh, you know, uh, we'll get people started. And maybe that's, I think it was Juna who said the gateway, you know, to the planetarium, but thinking that our colleagues who are not into this stuff will get up off their chair, even forget it. 
Yeah. Well, so we made a different bet against that, you know, so we didn't put it in the cafeteria, but we have a specific space for, for um, particularly the theorists to go because the observers, it's harder to get them out of their chair, but the theorists are just, you just put the coffee machine. I was going to say the coffee. That's the one, the one caveat, put the coffee there. So we <laughs> the coffee machines next to this incredible, um, it, you know, it's really a VR AR uh, system, but that's a different scale system um, for having collaboration meetings and that kind of thing where you do want that space. So of course we made a big bet that people would want to be together. And I think that's still the case. We just can't be together. Maybe we want to be together even more now. Um, but I don't think people, you know, in the long term want to be sitting in their cubes by themselves anymore. And I think we should be thinking about how we do science in a way that's actually not, um, you know, making us sick. <laughs> and standing desks is good, but actually how about we stand around and do science <laughs> together? I think it's all, and it's all a question about accessibility, I think. If we make it easy enough so that it's a very little, a very small hurdle to get into any kind of those kind of uh, environments, then I think people will come, as someone said before. If, if you build it, they'll come. If I if I could jump in too, um, so a couple of us on this this call, and maybe even some people that are watching, worked on a, a white paper this year called Ideas, and the name Ideas came from Anders Yinerman, who, if you don't know, is the king of acronyms. He can come up with an acronym for anything in like two seconds. It's amazing, and they're really good. And Ideas is Immersive Dome Experiences for Accelerating Science, and it is the idea that we did promote that there are, here's a map of all the planetariums across the planet. Here's how close they are to research institutions. Here's the things that we're asking in this, you know, decadal survey why don't you start putting some money not and yes put some money to hardware and software but maybe to also hybrid jobs that don't exist that should exist amnh is a huge powerhouse institution i'm not kidding myself that that we're we're not already like you know iconic and um and yet we only have like a small number of people that work on our viz but there's a cool model maybe for new kinds of positions i see it at astronomy conferences. Alyssa, you could speak to this too from having been around for much for longer than I have been around to watching people maybe want to get into a position that Michelle, similar to what your story was, they'd like a hybrid position. So if we can convince the funding agencies, maybe you guys should should fund positions. Uh, ask, ask Dylan, who was a graduate student in our department who went this path and who I believe is in Germany at the moment, Dylan. Wait, Dylan, where are you? I am in Germany. That's very true. You are in Germany. It's, Do you want to say something about? At night here. Yeah, sorry, it's past your bedtime. Uh, but to Jackie's question about job hybrid jobs. Yeah. Oh well, I think they exist. I'm not an expert. They exist, but they're extremely rare, and maybe there could be more abundance in the future. But I only know of. Yeah, but Less I mean, you're a person who has a PhD, a right? I mean, you have a PhD in astrophysics and you're kind of the king of visualization for illustrious TNG. So I think people would be interested in how that happened. I think practically the answer is what everyone already knows is that it's a hobby for me and uh, any job I get would be because of my science. And for some of us who also have an interest in visualization, you have to kind of add it on top uh, practically. Yeah. I, I'll, I'll say from <clears throat> the planetarium perspective, and one, California Academy of Sciences in um, San Francisco has been doing this really cool thing where they have people that are experts on open space that are also very well versed in, um, in astronomy language. They're not PhDs. They're, they work on the tech side of things. And whenever somebody's coming to give us a, uh, a talk, they say to them, this happened with Juna. When you come, you say, um, they'll say to you, is there anything that you think we could bring out of your talk as a visualization? And like, here's the kinds of things that we do. And the conversation comes, begins. And then instead of giving your standard talk, you're giving an immersive vis, vis talk almost. At the science pops so cool for people because they're coming for the experience of being at the planetarium. and. And then the astronomer walks away with a cool new Viz product. And it's an education experience that they can then use for other groups that come in. Now that model, we don't even have it at, we don't have it at Hayden, really. We don't do that with our speakers, but we're getting better at it. 
And my suggestion in writing, in, in, in I led the white paper that many people were on was, hey, NSF or NASA or whatever, why don't you throw a bunch of money, you know, whatever, at the idea that we should have more of those kinds of jobs. Maybe it's a postdoc or maybe it's, you know, you're investing in a future position. So. Well, I'll tell you, I'll tell you collaborations like, um, you know, like we have uh, between Angus's lab and, and, and my science, you know, it, emerging from those kinds of collaborations and we're, we're not the only one for sure, um, is a pool of uh, really talented developers and, and people who, um, you know, on the computer science side of things and biz side of things that could do things um, technically that, you know, we um, astronomers, I'll speak for myself, just uh, don't have the time to um, develop this, like, you know, this body of, of skills that um, that really um, lend itself well to, 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 to fully uh, realizing some of these ideas. So, you know, there's, there's definitely emerging a, a, a personnel pool of, uh, of people who, um, you know, and, and, and these are people who just have great um, insights about the data. It's fresh insight and um, it's, the, uh, it's the technical know-how of, um, of, of knowing how to curate these own interactions. And, you know, I, I talked to David, I talked to Oscar, um, you know, who definitely are, are coming from different backgrounds uh, uh, from my own. And, and you know, I, they, they teach me about my data and, and it's just such a really, a really powerful experience. Can I just add one more thing, which is the commercial aspect of this? Because in other words, I agree with everything that's been said, and and actually Matt just put a, a good link in the in the chat um, uh, that has to do with software development and this kind of model. But what I wanted to say is that I should give credit where credit is due. This collaboration that led to the demo that I showed you involves a commercial company called Delightex that actually makes an educational app, among other things, for these cubes. And so there's a lot of investment. I mean, this is specific to augmented reality, but you know. Apple's probably spent like, you know, some large fraction of a billion dollars uh, developing AR kit, and we're never going to do that. And most of the people who are using it are in the commercial space. You know, you can buy a chair using one of these or, you know, nothing, but you can't do astronomy. And, you know, that's wrong. And so we have to, I know Matt Brammer is running a vis in practice session right now. That's why he's not here. And, and I went to that one in Berlin. And there were people from um, companies at that. And so I think bringing that, I know that makes it even more complicated, but bringing them into the conversation um, can be really useful because, you know, now these people can go give real astronomy data to, uh, you know, students that they're, you know, making this app that goes to hundreds of thousands of people for and things like that. So there's like these spillover effects that you can't anticipate. But anyway, I just wanted to add the commercial partners part. So I do want to um, I do want to get to this question, this really important question that was in Discord, which is, you know, what are the things visualization researchers should work on to support analysis and visualization of uh, astronomical data? And I think, um, and so this person said, I'm thinking uh, this from the perspective of yesterday's fireside chat session. Um, and so, from my perspective, I would say. Um, you know, just be interested in astronomy and kind of reach out. I think that that's a, you know, I think those collaborations have to be made within these frameworks, but I think it would be good uh, to hear from perhaps Michelle on this specific issue since she uh, is, 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 has more of a perspective on both sides of that, of this domain. Yeah, absolutely. And for those of you who weren't sure what that fireside chat was referencing was that happened at the Believe uh, workshop yesterday, which is all about visualization methodologies and evaluations. It's like the heavy visualization theory and methods part of the conference. And there is a chat between Michael Krall and Tamara Munzner, these two figures in that world, arguing about the utility of things like design studies where visualization researchers come in and do some like small little thing, a piece. And Michael was like, no, that's not worthwhile. That's N equals one. And we should do more broadly applicable things. And there were discussions out there about and Alyssa Goodman and I have had lots of conversations. She's going to cringe at the idea of workflows and tasks. And she's 
<laughs> all these things that, you know, the framing that visualization researchers take, and it's like taxonomies and vocabulary to better understand how scientists and whoever wants to visualize their data. And that sort of helps you make the solutions or at least helps you identify where there could be solutions and analysis. And I think there's a lot of potential there actually in two parts. One is actually developing new tools and techniques. And I actually think design studies are a great thing in design studies with astrophysics data is fantastic. It's a little bit what Angus was saying of being motivated to work and come up with a solution based on like a particular data set or a particular problem someone has. But then there's also this whole other meta world, which is where I live in a little bit more in Viz. And I feel like the complexity of what astronomers need to visualize, to explore, to communicate can in many ways like break our theories, they break our vocabulary, they make us like, it just kind of breaks everything because of the people, the complexity, the collaborative aspects. And I think there's a lot of potential there. And I come from the very old school viz world and we have a unified conference. So we're never gonna use this vocabulary again. But I think astronomy is not just for those who do the spatial visualization, the scientific. The astronomy data offers a wealth of collaboration with the analytics folk and with the information visualization people and with the visualization arts communities. I think there's a much broader conversation we could be having and a lot of back and forth. I think there's also baked into that question. There's, so it says visualization researchers, not visualization engineers. And I think there's a potential like tug of war between that as well, because as a visualization researcher, you're always interested in making something novel and something completely new. And that might not necessarily be the one that the domain expert wants, because they might be what already know what they kind of want, but that has been done before. So it's hard to do new research on it. So like having like trying to uh, what square that triangle, no square that circle uh, is also not super easy all the time. But I think that's where those um, like meetups, particularly if it's not virtual and can happen over an alcoholic beverage. I think that's where those those things really come to shine. So I think that's really a good idea. Yeah, I'll just throw in there a metaphor that Michael Carell used in the workshop yesterday, which was we were talking about sort of what you can publish in the community and this tension you're describing. And it's like a doctor. A doctor doesn't write a journal paper and JAMA for every single patient or thing they do it's for the novel little discoveries but their day-to-day -day work is treating patients and saving people and there's that tension for the visualization folks right like i'm going to publish this thing but my every day is helping these scientists and like building these not inventing a new thing but doing something really valuable so i think that's a fantastic way to wrap up our discussion session and i'm hopeful that this is just one of many uh, discussion sessions to come with this group and those of you online. Final round of applause to all of our speakers and our participants on Discord. Uh, you guys were fantastic. Uh, you know, stay safe, everybody. Stay healthy. Uh, and uh, I loved what uh, Matt Turk said about, uh, you know, building a, a, a kind uh, and open-minded uh, community. And uh, really, uh, thank you, everybody, for, uh, for, for attending. Thank you. Thank you. So, Thank you. um, attention mechanisms have greatly improved the performance of many language models, yet with great power comes increased complexity. In this work, we present attention flows, a visualization that let users interpret the language model's decisions and gain insights into the underlying self-attention mechanism. We also support model comparison that helps to fill the gaps between models in different training stages. As data is changing, our understanding of data should be updated correspondingly. Based on machine learning approaches, we formulate a drip level index to monitor the evolution of multi-source data, which allows users to capture and reason significant changes from time series data. The proposed visual analytics system is called Concept Explorer. More details can be found in our talk. White space surfaces are a novel approach to convey depth in vessel visualizations. The core idea is to shift all additional depth cues away from geometry and to use the usually empty space between the vascular structures. This allows us to display functional parameters on the surface and supporting cues on the background. 
We will explain how to generate such surfaces and how to use them as a 